ever going to do continue to Philadelphia Hip Hop, Lady B. I ain't afraid to talk without a podium, but I got some notes. That's all right. We don't need it. We don't need it. So I got some notes. We're going to have a great time. Philly. First of all, B, you know I love. Man, come on. I mean, we can't. Even, love ain't even the word, you know? Let me take off my Rockefeller jacket for a second. In all due respect to Jay Z. I spent about $132 for this suit. <laughs> My wife said, look, get me something new, because I'm a Walmart type of cat. <laughs> and, yo, I love Jay-Z to death, but this is really a $60 outfit, really. <laughs> so I guess I paid $100 for a Rockefeller. That's all right. That's good. That's important. A cat that I think is doing the right thing, because he's a good guy. Just like most of the people, I think, in the game, it's, you know, they're good guys, they're good kids, they're good adults, they're good women, they, you know. But uh, I like to just, you know, get some things out by thanking uh, Mike Coy. And uh, how did we hook up, Mike? We, we've been in good contact. Me. Did we hook up at, um, the, the, me. Yeah. Right, right. Right at Diamond, Diamond Street. Uh, I was. Right around the corner, um, I was at a Mamiya Abu Jamal rally. Everybody, I guess, knows Mamiya Abu Jamal. If you don't in this class, if you don't in this class, come on. And you're in Philadelphia, and you're Hip Hop 101, and you know, really, maybe it's not your fault. 
Then again, <laughs> maybe this is an introduction to uh, uh, the, the fact that Mamiya, Abu Jamal, and the MOVE movement have put so, so much of a struggle down in this city to fight for the, I guess, fight for the rights of, of, of just black people in this city in the middle of, of, of Nazi Del Delphia. <laughs> Nazi Delphia, right? And don't get me wrong, like, like around this country, I've been to, you know, I've been to every single state. Well, I, some states I ain't been to. Montana. <laughs> North Dakota, South Dakota. I'm going to set this off. I've been on the election circuit for 11 years, since 1990. Matter of fact, I spoke at Temple in 1992. Matter of fact, this has been the busiest year speaking around the country ever for me. I've done at least 465 colleges since 1990, right? I just came here from Knoxville, Tennessee, University of Tennessee. They all said, what's up? <laughs> the day before, I was at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I was introduced to speaking at colleges from Sister Soldier back in 1989. And she introduced me to the lecture circuit, and I introduced her to music, because what she was doing in the community, I said, something needs to like branch you out, and people need to know because I knew that people followed um, artists. And, and by default in this country, when you want to see somebody magnified, unfortunately, they magnify athletes and entertainers. That's a sad aspect. In reality, it's the truth. What we deal and how we work with the truth and to get to that next level of work with what we got is also very important and that's what kind of magnet magnetized me early on. So this has been the busiest lecture year ever for me. It's like, I don't know what it is, but then two days ago, I changed something in my notes that made me figure out why am I so popular. I mean, usually I go to colleges and they, sometimes they be 300 deep, 400 deep, you know? This year has been 500 deep, 1500 deep, 2000 deep, and I was like, okay, Maybe it's one of these three reasons. Hip hop is part of the mainstream. And everybody feels that it's part of America like baseball, hot dogs, and apple damn pop. <laughs> Number one golfer they say is black, or Casablanca, or whatever thing he made up. <laughs> and they say the number one rapper is white. So hip hop's part of the mainstream. And out of 460 some odd colleges from the Harvards to the Howards, to the San Francisco states and Stanfords to the Mississippi Valley states, one thing I noticed over the 11 years that the commonality of hip hop has definitely bled into people 25 and 30 and under like it's a part of their bloodstream. So hip hop, Hitting the mainstream. One reason, oh, let's get Chuck D to come to our school or high school or prison. Number two, Napster and the whole file sharing revolution is probably the biggest news as far as the transition of the music industry since the CD. That's why, you know, it's on page one. I ask people, especially people from our community, from the neck of the hood, I say, yo, do you know anything about, you know, like getting the music like online? Oh, yo, yo, you know what I'm saying? Yo, yo, what I'm saying is like, yo, chat room, right? <laughs> <laughs> nah, oh yeah, but yo, I'll be hearing you with that, oh yo, son, I'll be hearing you with that, like, um, what you say, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I understand, dog. <laughs> Page one. You got five major record companies that control mostly all the music that people consume and like. They got three corporations that own all the radio stations that black folks listen to. 
and you got one company that controls all the video. Now you got Viacom that just bought BET. So now you got five, three, and one. If you black folks don't hear on the radio, they don't see it on BET. Excuse the language, but that shit don't exist. Hmm. So, Napster and that file share revolution, yeah, yeah. On the college campuses, across from here, over to the other side, maybe that's one of those reasons, because on the college campuses, cats is downloading music. They got bootleg mania going on. <laughs> and I'm part of the ones that be like, yeah, break the monster, rage against that machine. <laughs> I'll talk about that later. And then three, my, I said it must be the, the behind the music special on VH1 or something, huh, you know? Or something in the water. Or maybe all the three or neither of the three. But one thing we can't lose the fact that hip hop has become part of America, Americana. Under its own terms, that's debatable, but that's some of the things that I like to chat to y'all about. And paying all homage, this sister right here, Lady B, I wouldn't have no career if it wasn't for B, especially here. B broke me in this city like she broke in countless others in the thousands. I remember the first time B broke me in in Public Enemy. I used to just be a fan of Lady B back in the early 80s because she was fine as hell. <laughs> Had a good voice. I used to come down here, me and my cats, you know, you know, I mean, you know, cats today got, they feel that they got a rap to a female, you know, got a car and they bling in and, you know what I'm saying, I got the new whatever on. Me and my cats went to the Greek picnic in the U-Haul, 1984. <laughs> <laughs> so, yo, it was me and my three other cats, right? Greek picnic setting off, I ain't got no car. <laughs> We moved furniture with my father. He rent the U-Haul. We on Long Island. Philly's 100 miles away. We looking at each other. It's 6.30, Saturday. Yo, I'm driving to Philly. <laughs> then everybody want to be cargo. You know cargo, like cargo. <laughs> Come on. So four of us in the front seat, Philly, Matter of fact, Greek picnic is set off and they got a concert, the Fresh Fest. Me and my cats come right down New Jersey Turnpike from Long Island, four of us in the U-Haul, and we still kicking it with the females, still. We ain't got it yet. We in the U-Haul, baby, but we having fun. Matter of fact, we slept right on Broad Street by the old McDonald's. <laughs> Opened the back up and was like this. And I'm hearing on the radio, of course, you know, Lady B, you know, she, you know, they got Houdini, Run, the Fat Boys. I'm like, oh my God, they got a concert in town too, we going. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, because I knew about Lady B as being a, a radio DJ up in New York and we played to the beat y'all. I said, Lady B, okay, you know, played the record, loved it, you know, and then, I was trying to figure out, what's WHAT? You know, you hear things up in Long Island and New York that just, just like happen to leak up the turnpike. You know, Long Island has a similarity like Philly. That's why I always dug Philly. I was more into Philly than I was into New York because I'm from Long Island. And people from Long Island and New York somehow don't admit the fact that they country is hell. <laughs> All this like, yeah, you know what I'm saying, I'm saying Brooklyn. Yeah, but your mom is from Jamaica. <laughs> and then he was bragging about, you know, the great philosopher of our times, Rock Kim, said it's not where you're from, it's yeah. So people be bragging about where the hell they from, like, yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, but you don't own nothing there. Uh. All right, you from the Bronx, but at the same time, Big deal, you from where your mom's had you. If she would have moved to Cuba, you'd be Spanish speaking like a mom. <laughs> All that posturing, I, I used to always say, yeah, I'm from Long Island, I'm country. And everybody was just as fooled as each other in the beginning of hip hop. I, yo, 1976, turn me out, the technology aspect of hip hop. I'm looking at a DJ for the first time, right? Cause back then, it was like, 
Music was like for my sister and girls. Jackson 5, big afros, you know, platform. The guys wore the platforms back then too. Silk shirts, hustling. I mean, I couldn't do the hustle. I mean, hustle was some complex shit like people walk through. So we, it was just easy to just hate on them like. <laughs> until the freak came out with shit. Where you actually could get with a girl and go like this. You didn't have to dance and all, but you know, you could see. <laughs> it wasn't that the band, I never was into the band, but this thing with this DJ. And just to show you that New York is a country as hell, but just don't admit it. Grandma come from North Carolina, so you know the country just leaked up into New York. <laughs> I'm looking at two, you know, this DJ, I'm like, Damn, okay, yeah, he's doing his thing, right? Well, you need that other turntable. <laughs> well, he really coming for 10, in case that just break down. <laughs> I was totally stunned. Oh, he got, because he got this thing called mix in the middle. Mix. I mean, you mean the same thing? Mom cooked that cake for him. I mean, how you all put a mixer? Well, you couldn't see, so I think he got cake mixer behind the turntable. All oh, he got the DJ on the soap. There's a record I like by a group called War. But I like this song, you know, I like this song at the time called Galaxy. The name of the song is Galaxy. And, and, the, and the song went, <laughs> people going out of space. Very small little lead in. Well, I'm at this spot, right? Because, you know, half of it's the basketball court. The other half is the DJ. You know, girls on the other side, the other side, you know, two rims, about, cats got necks about eight deep. You walked a mile to this spot in the winter time, so you couldn't really go back. So, you know, by default, my attention is going to the other side, listening to, okay, he playing that wall cut, Galaxy. Dun, dun, dun. But this DJ kept, the music kept going on. Dun, 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 no words. I was looking for the words. <laughs> I was like, where are the words? I said, man, that record must be about this big. <laughs> so, and you know what? Everybody around me didn't know what was happening either. <laughs> so when y'all start, you know, hearing people talk about, yeah, so, you know, I represent back in the day with real hip-hop beats. I'd be like, what cats talking about? Real hip, what's a real hip-hop beat? That the beginnings of rap, in the middle of the 70s, Cats was rapping on what was there? Disco. <laughs> the beginnings of disco was not whack. I'm not talking about that Saturday Night Fever shit. I'm talking about the beginnings of disco started because when you study black people's music, you study migration. You, you, if you study migration, you get the music. You get the combinations in the music that somehow hybrid and to an understanding that we attach names to later. Like for example, the beginnings of disco come from the combinations of soul, gospel, and also Caribbean influence in making the music faster. That's why cats up in the Northeast, they talk faster. It's cold, you gotta get your move on. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, what's up? Yo, I'll catch you later, dog. So you ain't got time to kick it like, Dirty South, because I live in Atlanta, cats is back in the cut like, dog, yo. <laughs> like, <laughs> yo, on the real, dog? And they be like getting New York slang, because Atlanta's funny, they got New York slang, Chicago, they try to kick out West, they say something like, yo, dog, on, on, on the real, son? <laughs> We about to get a gat up in this piece. I'm like, all right, you give me some regions in here. <laughs> but, you know, the, the point of the matter is, is that the beginnings of disco started right here in Philadelphia. You know, OJs come from Cleveland, Ohio, right? Ohio's about down, 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 I mean, funk down. I mean, you know Eddie LaVert sings some song and he say one word, stretch it for three minutes. <laughs> they got Funk in them from funk funk. But Gamble and Huff from this city created 
disco, just, just all you gotta do is listen to the beat and the combinations, it's what I love music. Doom, 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 doom. From that point on, the beat became straighter and other orchestration added in. MSF, MFSB, mother, father, sister, brother, who were the instrumentation for the Philadelphia International whole catalog and group. And they was a bunch of old white cats. You know, Kenny Gamble would tell me a bunch of old white cats downtown that just played violins and all that stuff. Beginnings of disco, soul, gospel, calypso, all that feel, Philly was all into that music. One of the main rap joints in the 1970s was a cut called Love is a Message. It was a straight as hell, doom, doom. It had, was a soulful straight beat or whatever, but it accented other instrumentation. So when cats be talk about a real hip hop beat and yo, what's up with this? It's like, cat, really, on the real? You don't know what you're talking about. And often, we let a lot of things slide without checking people in the balance. So, what I'm gonna talk about, B, thank you, B put me on in this city when she put everybody on in this city. And even people that came on after, after B, B put them on to put people on. So in this city, straight up and down, like I said, I was fascinated in 84 just off the fact that Philadelphia was always a step ahead. It was just like Long Island, but it was always a step ahead because it was just like the, the music that come out of New York, Cats and Philly had to do it twice as better. You had to be twice as better. I come from the periphery of New York. I come from Long Island. And let me tell you, growing up in Long Island, I was always, you know, people thought they'd come out from the Bronx and Brooklyn just because they from the Bronx and Brooklyn, they can rhyme. I'm like, yo, really? <laughs> Cat, you come here, you get torched. When I was 18 years old, Cats caught me like Satchel Paige. I was 27 when I made my first record. My fastball was only 94 miles an hour. When I was 19, it had that like, yo, what? Yeah, yeah. Man, Cats would come from the bar, send them back in the cab. <laughs> I said, you better take the Long Island Railroad back. Cause, really, because back then it was like, OK, it wasn't so much you had to have something to say, but everybody had a cheap sound system. So if you had a four foot voice, you wasn't hanging. It was like, oh, you might have rhymes, but you know, nobody can hear you. <laughs> so I'd be like, nah, you don't need no mic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why guys like in the beginning, I was fascinated with guys like Melly Mel, because Melly Mel, you know, beside, you know, you know, despite his eccentricism, I guess you have to be a little eccentric or whatever. He, he was just like, man, oh my God, I never thought you could put so many words together and I didn't think you could say this word. And he says it's so powerful. Damn, you know? And that's why Melly Mel was really like one of the first phenomenal rappers, you know? And, um, but that's New York. But when you came down to Philadelphia, you got to pay homage to wherever you step into. And when Public Enemy first came to Philadelphia, I already knew about Lady B. Like I said, number one, she finds hell and she on the radio and she playing rap records. So we got a rap record and we got a group where we signed the Def Jam. And you know, really, New York, we from Long Island, so we consider country up there. That's all right, because I really like Philly better. Anyway, so B sets up a gig with Hiram, sets up a gig at after midnight. The, the one that's. The, the other after midnight, underground. Underground, underground yeah. yeah. So we playing there with ultra magnetic MCs. Oh, Who else was on that show, B? Just us two. And one thing, working in rap music and hip hop back in the day, one thing I knew, because we did, you know, hip hop radio on WBAU for about three or four years. We tried to promote shows. And the thing I always knew that would happen was this thing called ego tripping. Not the ultra magnetic record, but ego tripping. We give a cat an interview, we play their record. The next time they come around, this head is this big. Oh, yo, you know, for us to come out to the station, dog, you got to send like seven limos. Seven limos? You're crazy. We broke your record, dog. <laughs> you know, really. So one thing I noticed, I said, you know, 
it was this tendency is like, you know, you, person comes out, he come out of the projects, you pour a little fame on him, and poof, gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> I got involved in, in making, I, I tried to like, you know, produce rappers to do something, but you know, Rick Rubin got me to sign with Jeff Jam because he said nobody had a voice like mine. So I was like, look man, I'm too old to be making records, man. I got paid rent, I work, you know? I interviewed too many rappers that made records, can't pay their bills, I go to college. I got out of college in 1984. I went there six years at Adelphi. Should have got out in 1982. So somebody with some record company wasn't selling me on the idea like, well, I think you should do records because people have been asking me to do records since 1979. I'm like, look, first of all, I'm giving me an education. Number two, every interview, uh, every rapper that I interviewed broke. And number three, I'm, most, I'm you know, I love Jeff Jam. Let me, you know, let me try to build an empire in radio. But radio had so much politics, you couldn't crack through, unless you had this going for you, that going for you, and a lot of money, you know, trying to buy a radio station in New York, it cost $5 million, and unless you was a white corporation, you know, you wasn't getting that in that game. So, we did everything, through gigs, we did everything. So, I, so after a while, that offer from Rick Rubin started to look like, okay, maybe if I make this record, right? We put what we're doing on Long Island, everything we're doing, because the S1Ws were really a, co a, a company called Unity Force. And we used to throw the biggest gigs, and Unity Force was Griff and about 50 cats dressed like Black Panthers. And you know what's straight up and down? It'd be like, you know, you know cats would come from Queens, hoods, you know, back then, what, you know, I guess they called thugs hoods back then. So they come in, and they think they can run shit. Oh, no, let me tell you. These cats is organized. Griff, you know, he's Napoleon. He got like, he got like 50 of these cats. They're all martial artists. They kill you with a handful of rice. <laughs> Beat your tail and put you right back in the gig and pat you on the head like that. Nah, so they was part of our organization too. And I said, you know what? I'm not just going to do records. I'm going to bring this whole environment that we're doing, we call it Public Enemy, and we're going to actually do this thing with Rick Rubin. And then maybe after two years, we can do all these other things. Because I wanted to be a back behind the scenes person. So we put out the Public Enemy thing. A bunch of country guys from Long Island. <laughs> we do the Latin Quarter up in New York. I get my father's smoky yellow beat up van. It'd be smoking right in front of the last quarter and about 50 people jump out of it. Because we were the first posse group. Because, I mean, we had no other choice. It's one van and 50 of us. <laughs> and in Long Island, you know, driving was part of the culture in Long Island. Because after 11 o'clock, you ain't got no car, you ain't getting no bus. The train ain't taking you nowhere. The railroad take you to New York. There ain't no train. So that's like Philly. Philly, you got to drive. I mean, I know y'all got mass transit, but really in a lot of pockets, it's like a driving culture. It's similar. Parts of Lower Jersey. And you know, Long Island is travel, travel. So we go to the boroughs or we go anywhere. So my whole thing was to put together what we had put together on Long Island. Make a long story short and short story shorter. You know, coming down and doing that gig for Lady B, I said, you know what, just to show that there's an attitude in rap music and hip hop that I can't stand, like the gremlin attitude. We're gonna be the antithesis of that. And I would travel with the cats they call the 98 Posse. It was about 12 guys and they all had 98s. These were thugs on Long Island who got their tails whipped by trying to first disrupt our gigs, but then they made up with the S1Ws because they knew they couldn't whoop them out. So when thugs used to come from Queens and Brooklyn to mess with our parties, who you think would, who you think would um, cancel them out? 98 Posse, those are the thugs on Long Island. And then they would beat them up and that's what the thugs wouldn't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> and then if somebody really wanted to jump off or bust off, not only would they get their tails whooped out, right? Bad by the thugs and then the S1Ws, then we have brothers, right? 
cousins that worked in the, um, the jails. So say, no, no, not only that, you're going to Nassau County Jail. And inside, they're going to whoop your ass again. <laughs> so nobody wanted to come from New York City and act, act, you know, act really crazy. But coming down here, B set up a gig. And I said, you know what, man? We're going to go on down to the gig. Because we already played the Spectrum with the BC Boys on the Lights of the Ill. So we played the arena thing. And we came down here. We did the gig for B. And I told everybody, I said, when we go down to after midnight, we are not going to be behind no stage, no VIP. Because what does that mean, VIP, a very important person? The most important people are the people that pay to get in. <laughs> All right. I'm just letting you all know, because none of this attitude today is new. This attitude was back then, you know, the early bling bling and the show off, the ego, the gear. And all. No, we just wanted to destroy that because we just thought that there needed to be other aspects added to the hip hop game back then. So I told everybody upon order, you get the after midnight, 12 98s, three of our vans, we're going to go down, and there's a line around the building, everybody's going to shake everybody's hand. And B already had the songs jumping off, you know, on power. They was, I mean, they was like, blah, you know, man, public enemy number one and time bomb. I was surprised, like, whoa. But we shook everybody's hand online, and people were surprised that we wasn't like all oh, bodyguards and all. Oh, we all rolled up in there, just hung with the crowd. Ultra and everybody was, you know, they had their little VIP thing and all that. And they was wondering why the crowd was with us. Because the crowd was with us, because we was with them. <laughs> I was like, you know, on the stage, cool people getting down on the crowd. So, and cool keep, you know, getting down, and the cat's like, going like, damn, ain't you? Okay, damn, all right. <laughs> then by the time we got on the stage, we, it was easy to set it off. We made friends, and then that resonated. And so I thank you, B. I mean, I but B, you, B made it happen. And my whole thing was then, my whole thing then is like, you no, know, this star attitude, the VIP thing, gold around people's necks. You know what? That, that didn't come from like a super conscious decision. We would throw gigs, cats would come to the gig with, you know, real, real thick gold. Not real, <laughs> but real thick. <laughs> Even Eric B and LL, we'd be on tour. They'd be coming out with thick gold. I'd be like, that ain't real. <laughs> I know you spent $1,300 for it, but that's all right. I'll tell you a little story in that in a second. But anyway, kid, 11. 11th grade or 12th grade, he up in there go. He, he there with his homie inside the gig. This thug's roaming around like mm. <laughs> <laughs> So what would happen is that they would get so much gold snatched. You what are they gonna say? Oh, bring my, poof. They get knocked out. Then all of a sudden security got to You know, it would always happen to some kid that work at McDonald's for like 50 weeks, save up to get this one gold chain, and on the same night he wears it to the spot, gets it taken. And all of a sudden, it grows into something else. So we was basically say, yo, man, if you, you can't come in here with no gold on. And that's really what started the African medallion movement, or even the little clocks. Because, you know, if somebody's going to set you up, I mean, you can't be like having a steak on your hand with a pit bull at the side. So Cat be looking at you with an African medallion, be like. <laughs> peace, peace. <laughs> we did that for safety reasons. But now Cat's is right back again. They bling, bling, get gold. Gold, man. Dog, I got, uh, no, right, let me tell you, we a year and a half before people start reaching up in people grill. Like, mm, mm. <laughs> You want to see skulls on the ground, like, man, he went up in there and pulled that shit out, out his mouth and paying his mortgage. Cats up there, man, he fresh and them $300,000 worth of <laughs> got, you know, it's, it's embarrassing sometimes you got your grill worth more than your brain. <laughs> Look, let me tell you, 
This lecture is going to deal on rap, race, reality, and technology. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I ain't going to be that long, but it's going to be fun. Let me tell you, I've been doing this a long time. I will ball at this. Some of the things I say is like, look, it's not just based on my opinion. Opinion don't mean a damn thing if it ain't close to fact. You know how cats be like, yeah, yeah, straight up and down, yeah. On the real, I'm telling I'm going to start me like a TV station. <laughs> what we don't have is we don't have things to check dumb statements. Back in the day, you four foot one, you like, yeah, yeah, son, yo, dumb. It's like this, like, yo, on the real, I'm going to start me a TV station. What would people say? Oh. <laughs> but gun culture, which has unfairly been attached to hip hop, all of a sudden has what? Intelligent people what? Shook. Skirt. <laughs> now the four foot one person's like, oh, 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 really, right? I'm stupid, right? I'm stupid, right? Can't fight, never had a fight. Can't even lift a damn gun. Matter of fact, you know, like, I remember when Mr. Society came out. Cats all of a sudden start shooting like this because old dog was shooting. <laughs> Yo, dog, give me everything you got. You know what I mean? It's gonna get real ill up in here. <laughs> Unfair connotations of gun culture, jail culture, drug culture, and just plain dumbass culture are connected to hip hop and they are not hip hop. But, like I said, these are not opinions. These are actual things that are close to the fact. Opinion don't mean a damn thing if it ain't close to fact. If a person's opinion ain't close to fact, you know what? You know what are they talking about? You playing wrong, dog. Some people are afraid to tell people they wrong because they're afraid to get that what, what? It's like a person's got to go and leave and go to his trunk. Why you got to go to the trunk? Where you off right there. No, no, I'll be back. No, 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 no. <laughs> I remember Philly used to be the pug in town. Cats always in the gym boxing. Say, so you don't want to fight with nobody in Philly. They be fighting for real. They don't be like, you know, I mean, even ball players, they got that whole thug attitude. You know, Lonzo Martin and Larry Johnson. You know, it, it, it. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see ball players, you know, they dunk and then all of a sudden gonna be like, like what the fuck? <laughs> Fight? I mean, six nine and can't fight. <laughs> Just dump the ball and move on. <laughs> I done seen this town go from Dr. J. Barkley to Allen Iverson, is it? Hey. AI is my man. That's right. I like his attitude. Sometimes he has the attitude of, of a lot of cats, like, okay, one tattoo ain't enough. <laughs> Stephon Marbury got 50 tattoos. Like, like, come on, I know when you get 40, you're going to be what the fuck did I do? <laughs> Cats and hip hop, you know, you know, tattoos up in here. Like, don't even really know why they're just bored. It's almost like having eight earrings. And you ever say, okay, why you put eight earrings in your ear? Well, I ain't nothing to do, you know what I mean? But anybody over 18 has the right and choice to do whatever you want to do as long as you have the capacities of having your own mind. During this, this little talk, I'm gonna talk about intelligence versus the big dumb down. Hip hop versus rap music. Rebels versus thugs. Plantations versus community. Digging digital ditches and pick, picking electronic cotton. <laughs> <laughs> about that. If you go to college here, I'll tell y'all, you know, first of all, don't even front. Get your education. 
Because number one, uh, education, especially if you're paying, you yo, <laughs> believe all that fallacy or you want all that high or whatever. Look, if you're in college, right, your number one job is what? To bounce up out of here with a degree. Now, if you believe all the other stuff they talk about, but school's a business thing. And if you're paying money, get your money's worth. You hear people be like, yo, it's really cool. Yeah, damn, you know, I want that infinity right there. So you spend like twenty-five dollars or $30,000 for the infinity, right? Post somebody gave you a rusty bike. You'd be like, yo, y'all about to be sick, you know. You'd be reaching for guns they don't have. I'm very... How many people got rusty bike education? Been in school, what, three, three years and still a freshman. <laughs> so get what you paid for. Get your money's worth. I will also say have a good time for a long time. You grow, but you got your accountabilities and your responsibilities and then have fun. But don't have two years of fun and 15 years of drama. And you know what all younger cats got to do is look at the faces of black folks 40 and older. They be like, what you listening to? Why are you all, I don't check the bus stops. And then all of a sudden, that will tell you our society ain't really bling bling. Everything you see about us is not real. I tell people all the time, video? Oh yeah, after the video, the girls go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, <laughs> cubic zirconium, the mother, right? <laughs> QVC channel, you get some cubic zirconium for like $50. Oh yeah, this is silver, by the way, thirty-something dollars um, in Shannon Mall. <laughs> Nine-dollar watch I bought at the airport because my other watch band broke. <laughs> and then somebody said, "Yo, Chuck, how come you ain't got no Rollies or whatever?" I said, "If I had a Rolly, number one, I would sell it. <laughs> 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 Probably <in> your way." <laughs> <laughs> but number two, if I had a Rolly, it could be worth eight billion dollars. You guys, you best to believe that it would be a long way before it catches up to the wrist that it's on. Because it's a big drop off, because the wrist is the shit. And I make sure, I, I always, man, let me tell you. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm that Walmart bum type of cop. You know, like I said, I drove down to Philly in the, in the U-Haul, so you know I always thought I was more important than anything I could buy. You don't brag about a car. Car ain't a car, ain't nothing but a note. Car ain't number no. You know what? I drive by a car a lot all the time. But down in Atlanta, there's a cat that got like, oh, he got billions of cars on his lot. I said, that cat needs to get bragged about. Don't you think he's trying to get rid of them all? <laughs> he's trying to get rid of all them cars. You brag about your one little uh, car. I don't care if we got, I don't care if you could go to the moon in the car. Big deal. What it got to do with me? So everything you see on TV, Oh yeah, pool party, yeah, boy, oh yeah, everything is banging, whoa, whoa. Cool. Ain't showing sure nobody cleaning that pool party up. My wife throws a banging pool party. Who cleaning up afterward? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, whoa, whoa, Paul. <laughs> you know? Some of my beefs and gripes mean that as adults you can choose and you can regulate and navigate anything that comes your way. You know, sometimes you hear Lil' Kim, you be like, yeah, right. I mean, the older you get, you know, you be like, yeah, Lil' Wayne, <laughs> he's a little character. <laughs> if you're 24 and listen to Lil' Wayne, like, oh, damn, I wonder what Lil' Wayne got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'll be like, yeah, all right. I'll catch you later, dog. <laughs> Rap artists are made by corporations to sell to a bunch of 12 and 13, 14 years old. But the problem is the difference is that they're 28, 29 year old people talking about 28 and 29 year old issues to a 13 and 14 year old mentality. That's probably the, the situation which says that I think it needs more balance and diversity on real life. Because, hey, really straight up and down, I, I like BET sometimes, but as far as diversity in it, it ain't, get, it ain't giving me the yin with the yang. It just gives me yang and just like, yo, you know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes I keep, you know, my, my TV turned down. I keep it on BET. I call my booty and thug fish tank. 
<laughs> hey, I ain't got no fish, I just got booty and thugs, you know? Hey, you know, you keep the sound down, you know what I'm saying? It's, it just be on. What's disturbing, though, you see some cats sitting in front of BET in a, in a half cypher, 3.15 in the afternoon, neither of them got a damn job trying to scribble down some verses on their third bag of weed, looking with the remote, not changing the damn thing, talking about, yo, on the real, Ja Rule, yo, I, I'm feeling that cat, you know what I'm saying? Yo, what's that verse you had there? It's like, it's uh, 355, all right? You guys got a recording session. Don't be writing your verses in the damn studio. And just don't think that three sacks of weed is gonna make you better because you was whack before you had your first <laughs> You funny, Chuck, see? You funny, you funny, you yo, you, you funny, Doug. The thing is, like, look, I said, yo, Dunn, just straight up and down. You know where Dunn came from? A cat wanted to say son, said done by mistake and stuck with it like this. Yeah, I said done. <laughs> Kept it in their rhymes. And nobody checked them on that. It's like, okay, hey, you're gonna just get away and just slip up and not get checked. <laughs> oh, it could be because gun culture has intelligence pumped out. Gun culture got a person that smarter and knows better saying, oh, I ain't gonna say nothing because the little cat is crazy. This same four foot one inch character 30 years ago would have said something, somebody said, shut up. Oh, yeah, yeah, you shut up. You shut up. No, you shut up. Cat will shut up. Get that ass whooped. Now, all of a sudden, Cat said, oh, yeah, 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 shut up, right? Shut up, right? Now, all of a sudden, that big six foot seven character is kind of shook. Because little crazy cat could be real crazy. And that's one of the things that I'm saying that Things have distorted so much to the point that you have people, the last time y'all been to the seventh or eighth grade? Some of y'all ain't been to seventh or eighth grade since y'all was in it. Seventh or eighth grade, 2001. Let me tell you, I got eighth grade, a seventh grader, and a second grade, y'all be on, you know, come on. They be like, Yo, what was sipping on scissor me to you? <laughs> oh, yeah, you always ask a hundred questions, God. Yeah, cause I wanna know what you know. We just like the beats, and you know, kids are smart. I mean, they'll get to the point and be like, uh, you know, and as soon as the curse come and advantage is on the radio, they know not to say it. Matter of fact, they might not know what it is, and they'll keep going on or whatever. But at the same time, parents who don't know what what's going on, oh yeah, you listen to that little jibbity jibbity. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, you find a, a SUV or a car, four kids got their Walkman on. Parent don't even know. Yeah, well, I just brought because you know they had to take it to the house, so and, you know why didn't they trick that? Are you listen to the CD? No, I, I I don't really get into that. I like to listen to Anita Baker. That's your problem. Your communication gap has widened. You have no contact with your child, and that's been eight. Now that's the start of what's been leaking over in the white society. That's why they had a nerd to come, come up to me like, well, Chuck D, Newsweek of time. Well, Chuck D, why do you feel that, you know, first of all, so many white kids are into hip hop. Number one, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> white kids got into hip hop in 1988 with Yo MTV Raps. We did the first pilot, pilot. Will Smith, Fresh Prince, was the first guy that hosted Yo, the first Yo MTV Raps pilot. Me, Will, I mean, Public Enemy, Will Smith, and Daddy Jeff and Fresh Prince, to some of y'all. <laughs> of course, I'm talking to the choir, especially in this city. I mean, I go to colleges and I'd be like, Will Smith, Fresh Prince, same guy. <laughs> <laughs> then you hear somebody like, word? <laughs> Run DMC, because it was a Run's House tour, and JD Fad did the first Yo MTV Raps pilot in a barn in Austin, Texas, next to cows and mules and 
giraffes and <laughs> did the gig right there. People came down all. So from that point on, Yo MTV Raps broke out rap music across the country. Three, two years before that, the Beastie Boys took rap music to the suburbs. So somebody asked me, like, what do you think about the phenomenon of hip hop in the white community and Eminem? I'm like, you've got to be a dumb ass to <laughs> ask me that question. In 2001, sometimes it doesn't pay to be an ambassador to actually speak for the music, you know, because you get people coming to you when they should know better, but then all of a sudden they say, okay, cultural explosion. We have good effects and we have bad effects. Let's talk about the DOS effects. No, let's talk about the... <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the bad effects. Columbine. Trench coat mafia rolled up in there. Blah, blah. White high schools across the country have this all of a sudden rebellious attitude that a lot of people say, well, for what reason? They're looking to blame it on hip hop because hip hop has thug culture, I should say drug culture, gun culture, jail culture, and plain dumb culture attached to it by the mainstream because they don't want to branch out on the diversity. Who's they? Well, you got the record companies on one hand and you got the media outlets on another. I'll talk about that in a second. But it's no surprise why some of these things are happening because hip hop is cultural exchange. Now, I know, of course, in my chords class, you're getting Hip Hop 101, and we're not differing off of, off of, of what we're talking about as being the normal uh, subject and topic that usually goes on here. But I'd like to give you my take, how I've been taking it across America, or really across the world, in the last 11 years, because I think I have a, a degree in this unofficial thing. But a lot of people have gotten the definitions of rap music and hip hop twisted to the point that people think that they can freestyle knowledge. You can freestyle a verse, but how do you want freestyle facts? Oh yeah, off the top of my head, this is what I think it is. <laughs> Opinion don't mean nothing unless it's based on fact. Now, I asked people, well, really, before I wrote my first book, 1997, I took a two-year sabbatical. People would call me and I would just divert that to somebody else. They had asked, you know, of course the other one would be, ask Karis one or Ice-T. If it went Karis one or Ice-T, we was in trouble. So I was like, well, ask somebody else because I'm doing something, I'm behind, way behind the scenes, taking care of whatever. So I'd be doing whatever, have my booty and thug fish tank on, <laughs> turn the volume up, and somebody might, even ask a simple question like, okay, anonymous rapper, what is rap music? Rap? Yo, yo, on the real, son? On the real, rap? Yo, I don't do that shit. On the real, I don't, rap is what? I don't do that, I ain't no rapper on the shit, I, you know. Okay, all right, all right. What is hip hop? See, hip hop, that's what I do. That's what I do, cause hip hop is me on the real. So no, it's like this, kids like this. All right, what is hip hop? Hip hop's like, like you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean, yo, it's like this, right? <laughs> when the feeling, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? When the feeling, right? Come down, it's like, see, yo, inside you, yo, that should be real. That should be real, right? Right. I'm on the other side of the TV, like. <laughs> I'm pretty sure y'all on the other side of TV in the middle of the 90s, somebody just can give their definition on freestyle, their, their definition of it, a feeling. I mean, everything is a feeling. Love and hate's a feeling or whatever. But you've got to at least make sure what you're in, you have to be able to define it to the root. Because if that's what you do, know what you do. You don't want no doctor freestyling on your lung. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to think, oh. Yo. Damn, I ain't never seen nothing like this before. Yo, this shit right here is ill, yo. Yo, ho, 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 ho. Everything can't be hip hop. I don't want my doctor to be hip hop. I want him to be a doctor. I want him to be a super nerd. 
<laughs> Nothing wrong with a nerd. That's what they do. I mean, today, people are afraid to raise their, class, their hands in eighth grade class to be the smartest one. Intelligence will save your tail wherever you at. Whether you're in jail, the boardroom, temple, in the street, you can't be stupid. You go up in lockdown and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm the... You going, damn. Well, you're like, I, you know, I fly planes all the time. I, you know, I get scared as hell of a like, yo, what up, kid? <laughs> yo. <laughs> no, I want them all to say, yo, hello, how are you doing? I just fly planes. <laughs> I mean, we want some people with flair. I mean, y'all had the Nazi-dential selection, or the presidential election, that's what they called it. I mean, you had a boring person, a dumb, <laughs> this is a plain stupid candidate. And we're stuck with son of a bush. G-dub. And Gore, who's gonna vote for Gore anyway? Straight up, Mr. Boring Man. But anyway, the definitions of rap music and hip hop go to the root. You don't freestyle it. Rap music is exactly what it sounds like. It's two words. Rap, music. Now, people say, well, you know, what, what do you mean, Chuck? I tell people all the time, I said, people have been into music, there are more, more people in the music nowadays than they are into sports. It's just that music doesn't get supported with any kind of knowledge or history of it. Because if you study black music, you get our history over the last 100 years, especially by default. That's why Ken Burns' jazz 10-part documentary, which was rarely seen by anybody in rap music and hip-hop, because they're like, yo, I don't know about that. I'm just representing. How are you going to represent and not check out what made this part? You check out, I was fascinated by Ken Burns' jazz documentary. I was like, man, I've never seen so much black archival footage of New York in the 20s, Chicago in the 30s, you know, the, the meaning and, the, and, and just, I collect video documentary, I collect music. To be in hip hop, you have to have a respect for the music that, that helped make it. Now, you have to clap my hands for this, or clap your hands for this. You just, yo, simply rap over music is exactly what it is, rap music. Rap music is not music. It's a vocal application on top of the music that have already been defined the last hundred years, and so on. Let's get the definitions. Y'all heard R and B? What you think? Of, you know, you think you know uh, 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 what, what's, his, what's his name? I mean, you think to me is doing R and B? I mean, yeah, they're doing a hybrid of something else. Cisco, and no R and B is what rhythm and blues. But also, we gotta say, where did R&B, where did rhythm and blues come from? Did y'all know? Rhythm and blues came from a term by Jerry Wexler, who was one of the guys in the beginning of Atlantic Records in 1951, when he was writing for Billboard magazine, came up with the term, the rhythm and the blues. R&B. Jerry Wexler. You know, old Jewish guy. Now, the four rhythm and blues, that derived out of what? The blues. Three chords, guitar, middle of the country, delta, ding, 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 ding. You couldn't find a black person from the 20s to the 40s that they have a guitar attached to them. Just like cats got spray cans, a microphone, and turntables with them. Black folks back then had guitars attached to it. Yo, everybody had a guitar. Yeah, so the statement is ignorant when somebody comes up, came up in the 80s or the 70s or the 90s, like, man, why you got that white boy playing that guitar shit? When the guitar was the main instrument of black folks. Rhythm and blues came out of the blues. Rhythm and blues turned into rock and roll. Once white cats started doing it. But also, rock and roll had a dynamic of its own. Elvis combined what? Gospel, hillbilly music. Yeah, call it rockabilly. 
<laughs> and rhythm and blues. Little Richard combined gospel and rhythm and blues to make rock and roll. These terms like rock and roll, jazz, blues, gospel, reggae, those are terms we all know, right? Those are the musics that were used as a vocal application could be put on top of it. Now you got three types of music coming at you. Three types of music that's coming at you as far as application. You have a vocal without music, it's called a what? You have, it's, you have um, music without a vocal called what? And the process of putting a vocal on top of music is the process of what? Overdubbing. Anybody like reggae? All right, then you figure out why they call it dub plates. Dub plate is a reggae instrumental. We go back to a guy named Cool Herc. 1969, he moved from Jamaica to the planet of Brooklyn. Of course, black people, when they migrate, are going to go somewhere where there are people that they know already. So from Jamaica to Brooklyn, people in Brooklyn are also from the Caribbean. The style of DJing and toasting is already in Jamaica, two turntables, mixer, microphone, the DJ is the MC. All of a sudden, Cool Herc goes from Brooklyn to the Bronx. Not as many Car Caribbean people up in the Bronx like in Brooklyn. Although the same style of what Cool Herc likes, being a new American of the two turntables and the microphone, it's, you know, if he got down and putting on his reggae dub plates, people up in the Bronx are like, no, you turn that Jamaican shit off. <laughs> Cats is like, with James Brown. Slide the family stone down on. Loop that beat. Take some of that disco beat that works and catch and get on the mic and say something simply and not in the Jamaican patois, but straight up Bronx, New York, one, two, one, two. On and on like hot butter on the what the popcorn. To the break of dawn, y'all. To the beat, y'all. Yeah, don't stop. <laughs> Who hurt to say, oh, you know, let the Yankee take over. <laughs> it was his sound system. He had straight up Yankee on the microphone, and you had soul records on the turntable. So that process of putting the voice on top of the looping or the instrumental was still the same process that toasters overdubbed their voices on what? Dub plates. Rap over music. You only got three vocal applications coming at you. You got talking, you got singing, and in the middle you got rap. You got spoken word, a little bit over here, close to talking. James Brown did all three of them, or none of them, or whatever. <laughs> so the same thing we've been hearing over the last 20 years, like, oh, when is rap going to die? Saying rap is going to disappear is stupid as saying, oh, I wonder when these singing records are going to stop. You understand? Because it's a vocal application that's applied on music that already exists. Tribe Called Quest say, hey, we're going to do it on jazz. Most deaf will pick anything he want to be on top of. Rap music is not a music. It's a vocal on top of music. You're either singing, talking, or rapping. Some people, you know, you know, you hear them in the shower, they think they can sing. Oh, I just can't sing. <laughs> Some people just think, well, I can't, you know, I can't sing, but I'll rap this one out. Well. <laughs> now, hip hop, because, you know, like I said, this, cats would distort this on TV, too. I said, all right, let me get back on TV. Or at least give us a clear definition. Because the definition that's clear is the undeniable. You probably never heard the like, oh damn, that's quite simple. Because the music that got down came from everywhere else. Now it could be put together in a hip hop hybrid type of fashion. Hip hop, I counter the, the, the I counter the discussion over the last 10 years that people said hip hop is a culture. Hip hop is a subculture. And there's a reason why I call it a subculture. 
It's a subculture because when you talk about hip hop, it comes under the culture of black people. Now, first of all, right, when you talk about a subculture, it comes under the culture of black people, so I call hip hop a term for black folks' creativity for the last 30 years. We've been creative for thousands of years. We can't undermine that. If hip hop was to die tomorrow, we'd be some creative people when it dies. And at the same time, let's not be hip hop crazy because you can respect hip hop to the bone marrow, but you can't put it past the people that it comes out of. Now, does this mean like, yo, yo, Chuck, so what you saying, right? You mean like a white cat can't be hip hop? Of course. It's like a black person being a classical pianist or a golfer. It's cultural exchange. It's what brings the commonality amongst human beings and people to exchange culture. But understand, it's a part of our creativity. It's an aspect of our culture. It is not all of us, nor has it always been all of us. The difference is 10, 12 years ago, you could respect hip hop, but you had to respect black people first. Even back then, 12 years ago, you could be a white cat with a hip with an African medallion. The black cats got mad at me. Black people be mad, I'll take that off, white boy. And I used to say, no, let them wear it, because they know more about Africa than you. You got to step your shit up, dog. Oh, you did. And then all of a sudden, the white cats start, yeah, ISIS papers and start, you know, like, you know, saying all kinds of comedic things. And black cat be like, nah, man, I'm just gonna wait for niggas with attitude. <laughs> <laughs> easy way out. The easy way out. And I end up saying all these things were an aspect of rap music. Nothing totally wrong with the first discussions of NWA. Nothing was wrong with any of the discussions because all of it added up in a total discussion of what was going on, reflecting the whole environment. The situation that made it foul is when certain things were favored over other things and the balance and the diversity was not favored to reflect and tell the story of the total people. <laughs> Commercially, by the companies, at the same time, you know, 11 years ago, like I said, a white cat would have to respect, or a black person would have to respect black people and then respect hip hop. 2001, you can respect hip hop and pray to it. You ain't got the, and the little one's gonna hear me on this one, so cover their ears. You ain't got to give a fuck about black people. You can love hip hop, get official, get grip. You can win badges, get yo. Know, you can bling to ten million deep. You can shit on black folks and get paid more. Let's take the word, you know. Let's see how nigga has really moved on like a snake in the last ten years, 1989, 1990. Even if somebody said, "Yeah, so so nigga, what's happening?" Brother would be like, "Yo, yo, all right, why well, got to be a nigga?" All sorry, brother, you know, it's cool, all right? Well, and then whatever happened, happened. If you was white, you said that you just getting an ass whooped. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Over a two or three year period, even started with my good friends Dre and Easy and cats like that, niggas with attitude was accepted, and the companies that kind of hated, well, they had to kind of like take the sword. I used to tell them, I said, well, look, CBS, Sony, when you take public enemy, you're going to take the sword, you're going to swing the sword that's going to chop your head off. Because we, I've never been a nonviolent person. I mean, you hit me in the cheek, shit's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dr. Martin Luther King, but yo, really? Uh-uh, yeah, really? I would have had cats behind King like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we the Southern Christian <laughs> leadership now. So I've never been that nonviolent person. My daughter did, Daddy, stop the violence. I know, I mean, when it shoot fits, yo, you got to deal with it. <laughs> That's a whole nother discussion. That ain't got nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. 
I'm saying a lot of cats that ran the record companies did not like the fact that people, they, they loved the fact that hip hop was selling. They didn't like the fact that cats was like, you know what, straight up and down, don't let me come to the 52nd floor and just bust your white ass off. <laughs> <laughs> then they had their sons and daughters, like, I'm the enemy, wow, fight the power, dad. <laughs> That's cool, but why are they so mad at me? Because <laughs> you're foul, dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, with N.W.A. and Drake pretty much, you know, I mean, pretty much took the same music style and built upon the music styles out of the West, and rap is rap, you know? You ask a young person, like, yo, why you like it? I just like the beat, I like how shit is swinging, like, boom, whatever. But at the same time, there's underlying tones. In this country, negativity is favored because niggerism has been here since, what, 1609? The minute black people stepped off that boat, Whip was like, nigga! Even the person said, I ain't no nigga. So we got nigga beating to us with a lot of blood shed into that. So that's why cats in 1988, 89, when they feel that they found a little bit of themselves, even college students at that time would go into finding themselves and even burn themselves out by the junior year because they found out so much about themselves that they would almost be bugged out in isolationism. Because you can't cram your lifetime in two years. You're a freshman, you're a sophomore, you're protesting, you, 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 the more things you find out about America, if you keep it together, you'll just bug out. And it's real easy for somebody to just sit on the side and be like, yo, dog, stop worrying about that shit, man. Just <laughs> get this and fall asleep, get some chicks, and you know, don't worry about it. And then you bugging out like, oh my God. And then you gotta still take care of your major. <laughs> so that's what happened to the college movement. As they try to loosen up because it just got too big for them, because the more stuff you uncover and find, the more it can make you insane. Y'all heard that. And then all of a sudden, record companies said, well, it's rap, rap. We have this group niggas with attitude. And not to say, it, using, I'm using them as an example because the acceptance of saying the gun goes from the authorities back to niggas themselves makes it easier for somebody to say, well, hey, well, I'm a third party. I ain't got nothing to do with that. That's the discussion within themselves. And well, we'll keep pushing it. We'll, we'll have them in concert, even though for a five or six year period, it backfired to the point where the music sold, but nobody wanted to go to the concert. Oh yeah, they about ready to have a concert? Wait, wait, oh yeah? Oh yeah, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Mm-mm, that shit's gonna jump off. <laughs> no. I bought all their albums. And the promotion, it's easy to promote nigga in the United States because it always has been promoted. Now, just to tell you about the term, once again, being on the other side of TV, somebody would actually come up with the twisted logic and the freestyle knowledge of, oh yeah, we turn that word around, nigga. <laughs> Number one, they just didn't have a person say, you's a stupid motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but just because they are on TV, just because shit is on TV, oh, oh you know that. Well, that's meth, though, so what he's saying, yo, that's my man. Not to say that meth said anything like this, but also to tell you the fact, a lot of cats rolled along with the logic because they didn't have that intelligent person say, y'all sound stupid. <laughs> oh, tell the person said, man, I'm, I'm in a cipher full of some cats that might roll on me, I'll just keep it to myself. So intelligence says silent, but a dumb motherfucker talks loud. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Barkley ain't shit no more. Yeah, I get down there, I listen, man. I, yeah, right, nobody tell him he's stupid. Because he got a gun, a notion of a gun to protect him. So the gun protects stupidity. Hear me out for these 15 whatever minutes. We're going to really get fun here and here. So anyway, the word nigga, like I hear people like, yeah, on the real it's like this, son, like, yo, nigga, we turn that around, like, you're like, it's like a feeling of love, like, you know what I'm saying? You know, I roll up, you know what I'm saying? My niggas want to be there. I want to be there with my niggas, you know what I mean? And, you know, even, you know, even the white cats with me, man, they rolling, they white niggas, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they be on TV. And nobody telling them, like, y'all some stupid motherfuckers. 
<laughs> I'm stupid, right? No, don't go get it. I don't want to fight. Because <laughs> intelligent people are also perceived as being what? Soft punks. That's why the eighth grader, the smartest one in the class, don't want to raise their hand no more. But at the same time, the dumbest one, the funniest one, where they used to wear the dunce cap, now they wear a crown. The clown wears a crown. Oh, because they uh, nobody wanna be the smartest no more. What? Intelligence will save your ass even if you in lockdown. Be a loud, stupid motherfucker in jail. The first thing is, Hey, yo, say I'm lying. Say I'm lying. So a cat would say, well, this is a nigga. I'd say, you can't turn every word around. That word got 400 years. So somebody said, all right, Chuck, yeah, all right, man, all right, 400 years. I know I want to hear that old African heritage shit. <laughs> okay, let me tell you how you can't turn every word around, cat. Let's say a person comes up to you and say, yeah, so what's up, man? You know I love you, punk. <laughs> cat be like, punk. <laughs> now, I ain't hear all that other stuff. So what do you say? Why do I got to be a punk? <laughs> Yo, I, I love you, punk. That's a simple word. P-U-N-K ain't even a curse. Cat be really offended, like, ooh, call me a punk. You can even go deeper. Call a brother a P U S S Y. Oh, that's one of those reaching in the trunk, like, yo. yo. <laughs> you couldn't turn those two words around in 200 years. How you gonna turn a nigga around in 10? Nigga worse than both of them words. You turn around, oh, you turn nigga around eight years. Cause you have a big corporation with some money behind it saying, yeah, all y'all niggas. Oh, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make rich niggas. And you'll pray to rich niggas. Oh yeah, oh, songs, songs are irrelevant. Because they said, we've been recording companies since 1923. The same company that puts out dead press today put out Public Enemy 12 years ago, put out Sly Stone 30 years ago, put out Johnny Mathis 40 years ago, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, down to Bessie Smith who sold the first race record, 2.3 million race records in 1923. All of a sudden, we're gonna say, oh man, that's some old shit, that shit don't apply to that. If somebody was to saw Ken Burns Jazz series from one to 10, and somebody was really conscious of the fact of what they was looking at, they'd be surprised to find out the same shit's happening right now. All you got to do is only 100 years. 100 years ain't shit in the jack of time. And then you can see the same thing happening in cycles, cycles, life goes in cycles, new is old, no, it ain't no cycle. Shit. So, the acceptance of niggerism. Give me, you know what I'm saying? Give me some time on this. I mean, it's gonna be fun. We got schisms going on with cats is like saying, well, underground versus commercial. Cool, whatever. You even have under the underground as far as internet artists. It's the fact is that a commercial artist and mainstream artist is gonna actually deal with the area of what? Making a company reach their bottom line. It's going to come across the radio stations, three of them, which are owned by three, I mean, three corporations own them all. I think B, I think you represented all of them at one time, right, playing the corporate game with you. You try to do the right thing, balance hip hop, they're like, B, right. what numbers, Wendy? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Even, let, 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 let me tell you, BT just fired Tavis Smile. Now, they, have been bought from Mr. Bob Johnson, who's a very nice man, but I'm pretty sure we had nice Nick Jigaboos back in the days and also. <laughs> Ain't nothing against Bob Johnson, just cause he's the nigga in the middle of the mix. Bob Johnson got BET because John Malone of Cox Communications was in DC getting the cable situations done for this country and went up to Bob Johnson, who was a lobbyist in D.C., and said, hey, you want cable? You know black people want cable? Oh, yeah. Boom. Got to give it to a black guy anyway. Just a situation, just being there. Anyway, Viacom bought BT. First thing you want to do is 
get rid of Tavis Smiley. And out of 23, out of 24 hours, one hour of balance of making sense, they decide to eliminate. And I said, ain't this something? One hour, Tavis Smiley. They said, you know what? Tavis just doesn't get the numbers. Comic View gets 5 million people. Tavis Smiley gets 750,000 people. But we fail to understand, or they fail to understand, that 5 million people watching Comic View don't mean shit to the 750,000 that watch Tavis. <laughs> Corporations say we ain't nothing but a damn number. That's why to them it's quantity over quality. That's why sometimes you can take four fighting badass motherfuckers and go up against ten motherfuckers who disorganized and bust them in the ass. You don't want no weakest links. <laughs> Same thing with, you measure the 750,000 black folks or people watching Tavis, don't they have more weight than the 500,000 people watching Comic View? I like to laugh just like the next cat. But there's a difference. There's a difference, not the Viacom, peaceful protests, I don't believe in that. I was like, yo, go on up to Viacom, if you don't really fight for it, get about 50 motherfuckers again, oh, they want to be thugs? Go up and drag that cat round out and beat his ass. <laughs> Look, people be calling me, they be calling me, they say, Chuck, I want you, I'm like, you don't want to call me. I'm not one to go to jail because I ain't glorifying jail, but if 30 of us are going to go, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go. And you know what? I ain't, wanna, I ain't going through this and that. No, no. You focus upon the culprit and the enemy. One person made that decision. Put the yoke on that person. I said, you know, we ain't got to do nothing even physically. Just follow him to his crib. <laughs> Oh yeah, me and about seven other cats just decided to follow you to Connecticut crib. No, black folks afraid to do that. Oh no, we have to have peaceful conversations and nothing. That don't do nothing for black folk right now. We're in a state of emergency and in crisis and war right now. You know what? Y'all can handle it. Y'all are quiet. But the thing about it, we have kids who can't handle it. Everybody, even the person that, you know, person that think that they can handle it and can't handle it, they basically are children themselves. So really, what it boils down to, you got corporations, right? Nothing wrong with balling and booty shake. We know we got ballers around the world and there's always shaking booties in Africa. <laughs> Big booty shaking in Africa too, make you go damn. People have been picking up National Geographic to see the African booty. <laughs> so it's definitely a wonder of science. But there's definitely got to be something behind it. There's got to be all the balance of diversity going along with it. MTV is responsible for te extended teenage years to 29. <laughs> <laughs> we say that there's common sense out there, but is sense common? It used to be common. There's no such thing as common sense. Either you got sense or it's nonsense. Nonsense gets it, yo, yeah, we gotta let nonsense fly because people are afraid to check the person saying nonsense. Why? Because they say, well, everybody got an opinion. No, person don't know what the hell they talk about. Need to stay quiet. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you how people even shook on the college camp. How many college students we got here? Now, how many of y'all know about the fact that collegiate thugs? I know. It's an oxymoron. <laughs> collegiate thugs. I've been going around college for the last five, six years. All of a sudden, cats is rolling like pot up in college. <laughs> Beep a gun, selling drugs on campus. I like the cat is fake. Because, you know, the block, you know, those are some real, look, they might even be fake thugs. But the thing about it, they more real than somebody on college campus trying to front off like a thug with a scarf and whatnot. Yeah, like they the Temple Crips. <laughs> checking it. <laughs> Intelligent people are pumped. Even when they get the degree, they don't know where they fit. Black folks got to know it is apartheid in America. You leave the college, you, where you going to go? Right back to a black hood anyway. So what are you going to do? You're going to be invisible, transparent. <laughs> you want to say something that makes a difference because you're going to have kids. Or you're just going to, you know, just 
just don't mean shit to anybody. You don't do that, eventually, you know, Destiny's child gonna be your, your kid's parent. Say my name, say my name. <laughs> Daddy not no survivor. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working this thing too long to be saying that what I do is just associated with jail culture and drug culture and gun culture. I understand growing up in the hood, that those things were there already. They were there before rap music. Dumb culture associated to rap music and hip hop. You could be stupid and actually get more props. Yeah, where did that come from? I come from back in the day. You said something wrong, an older brother was kicking your tail. People say, oh man, but Cats is crazy today. I say, yeah, because they crazy today because they got the aura of a gun. You know, over in Thailand, that's why I said, if I ever ran for office, that's why I said, people, don't, don't ask me to run for office because it'd be a bad first day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say, yo, dog, don't even come to me with that. Because really, a lot of people might be mad at me because the first day, it's going to be hell. It's going to be hell for some. You know, it's going to be bad. So I said, I'm not even, I don't, I might run for politics when I'm 70 years old. <laughs> what, at 40? You crazy. Boy, uh-uh. Education, you know, it, it. Anyway. <laughs> jail culture. How the hell is jail culture part of hip hop? Jail is not fly. All of a sudden, cats walking around like they swole, like, yo, jail's the place they rolling up into. I do lectures up in jails. Cats is mad they up in there. Well, you got some punk ass college kid or a high school ninth grader rolling around like he rolled, want to roll up in that piece. Getting a peek at eyes. Also, white America, they're keeping eyes on the, on the TV. You know, like, oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> I don't give a damn about eyes. I hate eyes. You know, you, you know I watch the Sopranos. Even they might be some gangsters or whatever, but you know what they got? You know, they talk about building structures and family and yo, we ain't letting the, you know, we be talking Nicky Barnes and shit or Capone, but that's just on some, oh yeah, let's get in our car and shoot at some shit. <laughs> at least, you know, Sopranos got a storyline. They say, well, the parallel, you know, show to the Sopranos is, is the corner. The corner, I don't, I hated that show. Hated that show. I'm like, what I got to learn from that damn show? All I got to do is see the real corner. Well, it's an educated white America. But jail is not fly. Hell no. And the fact that slave, the new slavery, you had cats, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? They had slaves again, you know I ain't going. All they got to do is say, come out with your hands behind your head quick. Bring your ass out here. Four weeks ago, I spoke in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, one of the most decrepit cities ever. And I spoke there, Vine Street. My baby, you, you, know, you don't even know what Vine Street is about. Anybody see the movie Traffic? Where the girl go cops and drugs, that's Vine Street. I even put it in my commentary. I'm like, man, you're the sister. And, and by, any co by no coincidence, three weeks later, on Vine Street, another cop shoots another black kid. So we bragging about jail like we want to roll up in there. Cats talking about, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm a, what? How do you want to connect that with hip hop? New slave labor, cats up in lockdown, happy to work, especially if they catch in the 10 or two to 25 to L. Cats is happy to work just to do something. Corporations buying the jail and all of a sudden, oh, they got a big old shed in the back where they could be making computer laptops. Then you'd be wondering, damn, why laptops are $179? <laughs> they made it in Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> Where Mamiya is at? Not only Mamiya there, Cool C is there. Steady B, oh. Oh. young cats, swept up with the image of thinking that, oh, I got to maintain image. We got to maintain realness. Nobody give a damn about them right now. Oh, yeah, everything looked good. Like, yeah, it's always good to accept somebody coming out. Ooh, I like it so rough. You know, boom, dunk backwards, catch. Oh, yeah, yeah, he rough. Oh, yeah, Ray Carew. He up there. Oh, yeah, this guy to die, this guy to die. Y'all heard it before. 
okay. Homegirl died. Who wanted to be Ray Carew sitting in court TV? Nobody! Motherfuckers turning quick by court TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but a lot of cats done kicked that before. Oh, yeah, right? If it really got to come down to it, how many people visited the aftermath of that? What would be quiet as hell? Sweep a kid in there. I say, yo, take a seventh and eighth grade class to jail for a whole week. You'll get big changes. Damn, talk about Patrick Henry. Take them to the local jail. Let them get some of that bravado up out of their head. Gun culture. You know they ain't making no damn guns. All of a sudden, we swear on an equalizer. Give every black person a gun, and they know they have to shoot ourselves. They ain't equalizing nothing. Matter of fact, that's why gun culture is so accepted. Yo, I just came from Knoxville. They talk about trying to Walmart trying to keep out explicit CDs. They sell guns at Walmart. <laughs> How the hell are you going to say we'll keep CDs out when we're selling guns? <laughs> well, we selling guns to people who live around here that want to shoot niggas. <laughs> drug culture. Drug game been the oldest game in the books. If anybody studied drug culture, you know that damn and damn Chinese were infiltrated by the, 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 the damn British with opium to get everybody split and divided so they could go in there and do their thing. Right. I wonder why the Chinese still ain't got an attitude today. Right. They be like, fuck that, we ain't giving that damn plane back. <laughs> <laughs> but these be the discussions up here. And even if somebody said, yeah, yeah, that's just that's, that's politics. So people who always used to be the city. Like, yeah, you know, like so-and-so, you know, public enemy politics, but so-and-so is whatever, they street, so we can roll with that. All politics, they'll take the glow off. Politics is who's running the damn streets. Right. Being street just mean you on that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right, whatever is whatever. Drug dealer on the street, he on the street. What's behind him? Oh, running Scott free. Drug dealer on the street, gets got all the time. I always used to say, I don't know no 30-year drug dealers. 30-year career, like Barry Bonds. <laughs> I'm the Barry Bonds of drug dealer. You best to have George Bush behind you if you're one of those cats. Oh, we got son of a Bush. <laughs> George Bush dealt with more drugs than anybody in the whole planet Earth. Preach. Preach. You can see him just behind, you know, G Dub's back, like, eh. <laughs> Don't bring that plane back. You know, you know, you know. You know, make something, make something out of it. It was only until Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson said, yo, I'll go over there. No, let's get it. Yeah. <laughs> Say you're sorry. Because that Jesse Jackson would have made them look bad. Right. Finally, when it comes on down to us, we say dumb shit like, yeah, for real, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, what's up with Jesse, you know, having a baby and shit? Cat, you got eight babies. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't taking care of none of them. <laughs> Let me doing, you know what I'm saying? If he's doing some leadership, let him just do his leadership and don't worry about his personal life. Yeah, what I'm saying, I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know what I mean? I mean, really, man, we ain't got no lead, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying. Dr. Jesse Jackson thinks somebody told me and said, look, really, it boils down to it, right? You need your brain worked on, you need a brain surgeon. This cat, he might be a player, but he's the best surgeon. This motherfucker is straight and Jesus and all that. <laughs> but he's a far second. I don't want that motherfucker working on my brain. I don't care what he's doing. Doing his own, do his job. I ain't got nothing to do with his personal life. That's the same thing. Everybody in this room growing except for exception a few little ones. Whatever you do with your personal life, it's your prerogative. Even drugs. You want to smoke drug in a crack, in, in a cornfield? You want to crack? You want to, you know, like, you want to go like, hit X and bomb, blah, 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 like that? That's your body. <laughs> That's you. You want to X out? Cool. The problem is when you start fucking with people, trying to steal their DVD players and shit. <laughs> That's the problem. The game is messed up. I mean, water kill you. You heard of drowning? 
<laughs> the game is what got blacks messed up. Because we can't manage things, and we can't do things in moderation. And therefore, we take on things that we don't even understand, just because some peer might do it. Oh, peer, oh yeah, he do it, so I'm doing it. It's called roboticism. So anyway, like I said, the cultural exchange that rap music is, and the, it shouldn't surpass the legacy the people it comes from. The last statement, and it is related to rap music and hip hop, is just the fact of community. We ain't had no black community. Black people have been living here in Philadelphia for 200, 300 years. Richard Allen, and you know, they, they always come up. Well, black people have been living here since the Quakers. Richard Allen. I'm thinking, all right. We ain't had no community. Black folks are still in a plantation state. A community. I got two more minutes. Let me stretch this to five, Mike Cord. I got two more minutes on the tape, right? <laughs> oh, maybe I can stop right now, you know? But look, look. A community, right, is when you got control of your realities. Your education, your economics, your enforcement. Look, education. We got a whole bunch of black people in buildings. They're not teaching black people how to live in America. We also, back in the day, used to look at that as being an excuse. Like, oh man, school system failing us, so therefore I'm staying home today. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you need 14 grades. That's what <laughs> I believe black kids need to start first grade at four, three, and then go up to 12, 13, maybe 14th grade. Y'all see it even in college. Freshmen be up there. They really need 13th grade, 14th grade. But they be getting kicked out after they're a sophomore. I ain't going to school this semester. I'm making cheese steaks and stuff. <laughs> it ain't bad for the job. A job is a job is a job. I mean, just like you see kids, nine years old. I thought, oh, 13, 14, 15 years old. McDonald's is good for them. I mean, it's a job. I mean, people are like, well, I ain't messing with the clan. I ain't messing with the clown. I want to just try to all of a sudden be all crispy. <laughs> so uh, economically, you ain't got no black businesses. You ain't going to get young black people jobs. Young black people are going to wear McDonald's. Hey, Dave Thomas, put me down with Wendy. Can I even marry your daughter, Wendy? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Number one employers of black people are still white corporations, soon to be jails. I'm like, hey, you don't have black businesses, you ain't gonna have black jobs for young black people. Simple as that. Education, like I said, ain't got that. Enforcement, police, please. In this city, oh, y'all should know. Police means to protect and serve That's right. property owners. That's right. We own shit in America, y'all. We own a, We ain't got a window to pee or a pot to. You know, you know. Pot to pee and a window to throw it out. Ain't got it. Black folks gave up their land with that rap group. But back in the last dec uh, last century and before, Jim Crow and the KKK, <laughs> they was down south. When they said, yo, we up in the house, black folks went north. That's why New Orleans, Mississippi, Tennessee, black folks, Jim Crow was in the house, black folks went straight to Chicago. Even dealt with the cold to get away from Jim Crow. Didn't look west, didn't look east. North, up the Mississippi. Same thing like Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati. Black folks come from Atlanta, Alabama, straight up through Tennessee, Kentucky, North. Up what they would have called, you know, they call it 75. No, black folks made their own 75, straight North. Jim Crow, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, straight up the Eastern Seaboard. That's why if y'all from Philly, 
Most of your family come from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. You ain't got family from Kentucky or, or, or Arkansas or Mississippi. Because your black folks went straight up the eastern seaboard, up what they call what? 95, or Route 1. There's only one way to go, straight up. <laughs> so if you study the migration of black people, you get the music by default. The music travel with black folks, getting away from Jim Crow. Last points. Mike, I got to let people know these last points. I know they're going to kick us out the building. Oh, yeah, we, that can't happen. Well, here. Oh, I'm going to be finished in a second. Oh yeah, Q&A, yeah. Of course, now, now, I, hey, you know, I, I'm gonna be here. So, so, I, I wait till it's clear, because this is the final nail clinching point. I left out technology on this speech. I'm gonna, I'm gonna brisk on that a little bit, because we got some time now, thanks to Mr. Mike, thank you. You, you know, you, enforcement, property owners, that's what police are out to protect. They ain't protecting human beings. Yo, you could go in a black neighborhood, burn down a building, you get more time for that than shooting a black person. But, but police told you that. <laughs> we, we protect and serve property owners of the community. We ain't had no community. We still in a plantation. Plantation asked for education, economics, Enforcement and everything else from the master, from the outside on in. That's a plantation. And we ain't got black communities still in 2001. A weird od odyssey. When you don't have control over your realities, those three E's or four E's, then what you have, a blurring between fantasy and reality. Why? Because upon the reality, fantasy could get sold to you. People could get lost up in their own little world. People would come up with their own logic and be like, not even, not even making sense to nobody else, especially in the age of technology. What's reflection could end up as a directed dictation because when you have fantasy sold to you, you have a situation where not just, hear me out, not just art imitates life, but life to imitate art. And people are confused between the two. Case in point, proof. Three years ago, I'm watching, or maybe four years ago, I'm watching Chicago Bulls, Utah Jazz. Fine. Mike Jordan, you remember the one, he's sick, he got the flu. Oh, Jordan, you know, like, oh, I can't stand the Bulls. I'm a Knicks fan, right? And the Bulls whooped out the Knicks for so many years, but at the same time, Bulls in the finals, I got to give credibility to the cat that works on this thing. So Jordan, I'm sitting there with a shorty, and he up there watching the game with me. Because, you know, up in Long Island, we have cats coming by. We'll all watch TV and whatnot. So I'm up there yelling in his face, because, yes, I am loud. Yo, Jordan, what? Ah! Yeah, you know, his, his type of ball player, make one move, dunk backwards, got two points. 25 turnovers, but as long as he got, as long as he shined on one play, he's good. But his team loses about 50. He he love a team like the Clippers. Darius Miles, you know, slam backwards on somebody. He's done. Yo, that's that's enough for me, son. So Jordan killing him, right? And Cat is sitting here with his wood stick. You know the you know the pose. No, look, no, he was like he was like mint bleaked out. So I'm yelling at him, "Yo, what?" He's like, "I said, what you got to say about Mike Jordan?" Yo, man, I be busting that cat up every day on PlayStation. <laughs> TV didn't mean nothing to him. Reality didn't mean nothing to him. 
His whole world is somewhere else. It was like, what's the virtual reality in this? His reality is not the reality of what he wants to roll and fit into. He making up his own rule in his own head. The universe now exists of a whole bunch of planets. And the planets are all individual heads. Making up their own rules, their own logic, to their own world. You can walk amongst many, remember? Juice, Tupac, remember he came in the funeral? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mrs. You know, uh, he acted like nothing happened. How many cats you know that if they busted somebody off and then all of a sudden just like, because all of a sudden they could just like, I never even did it. There's reasons for that. There's reasons why rebels have turned into thugs with a price tag at the end of it for somebody. You got to figure technology into all this. People say, oh, yeah, but technology, I don't mess with the computer. And, you know, it has no effects. It all starts in the home. No, let me tell you this. The strongest weapon and tool ever created in the past hundred years has been a television. You can have a million Qurans stacked on top of your head like Curious George with hats. <laughs> Passing them out. Dialoguing on the street. Politicking and yelling at somebody else on a, on a verse from one of the scriptures and yelling while people walking by you like saying they, they crazy. They talk about something 3,000 years ago. Pretty much on the same point. Not dealing with the commonalities, but talking about the differences. Meanwhile, something come on TV, boom! Cats is flipped around overnight. Television. Telling lies to your vision. Oh! Peep this. Oh, we ain't got the United Plantation of niggas and the Wee Buffoon and Network for nothing. You look at something on television and it could come at you. And the difference is for 30 years ago, 30 years ago, raising a child was like what? Programming a computer. It's like, okay, I'm going to tell you what to do. Clean, clean the room up, vacuum the rug, going out there to play. I want you over at Boo's house. I want you in that, you know, Go by the creek, you can play with on your bike or whatever, boom. Now, you got to deprogram a child, find out what's in their head, and then teach them. If you don't know what's up in their head, how can you put something on top of trash? Because trash will cancel it out. This is all technology. This, this is all technology. Difference is, case in point, you look at an SUV, kids up in there. Four kids sitting in the back. Each one of them got their Walkman and headphones on. Parent got the Nita Baker on. Each kid, let's bop into their own groove. 30 years ago, if I wanted to hear music, I got to sneak in with this big ass record up in the crib at three o'clock in the afternoon, I don't want to be there anyway, and try to negotiate with my mom that she is home to play this record. In order for me, it's too much work. I'm gonna go out and play, forget music. <laughs> Young people could get music like that. All of a sudden, six-year-old kids matter to the bottom line of a corporation. Because they get mommy, mommy, I wanna get Trick Daddy and Trina. I wanna, you know, take it to the house. <laughs> and the mother ain't hearing no other cuts with Trick Daddy's album. She okayed the video. The rest of the album, she don't know what the hell going on. Matter of fact, she tired of her badass kids. I don't want long they, they happy listening to their thing. But for the first time, you have what? People programming themselves. They think they're programming themselves. They could get programmed from somebody else. All of a sudden, you don't need human interaction. You can have people serving machines. That's what the Matrix was about. Machines over human beings. Anybody want to see the Matrix? Did you take somebody, hey, don't, don't clap. <laughs> I ain't make the movie. <laughs> Did you take somebody to see the Matrix? Did that person understand? If you took a person that didn't understand the Matrix, the movie was talking about that.
Say I'm wrong. Say I'm wrong. Black folks, we master no technology, but technology has resulted, has resulted in the slimmest of communication and generation gaps ever. 27 year olds don't even want to be bothered and don't communicate to 22 year olds. Unless a dude, you know, he's 38 years old going to Daytona Beach, talk about talking to my 19. Hey, come here, girl. We've been up here 16 years. We're ready to go to Freaknik next week. But really, the 28 year old don't know what the 22 year old doing. The 22 year old don't know what the 18 doing. 18 year old they communicate to 15. So you have the slightest and the slimmest communication gaps ever. When you have a situation of sense versus nonsense, you have to question whether people or people or the people have been reduced to sheeple. <laughs> hey, y'all know the deal about sheep. Sheep don't make no decision on their own. They follow, right? They usually follow. A wolf who's dressed in sheep's clothing to wear? The slaughter. That's where black folks is headed because you don't have control of your own thoughts. What you think, you got control of yourself. These are, you're not electing, you're selecting what's given to you. What's presented in front of you. What's, yo, just bring it, breaking it down to being real. If you don't hear it on radio and don't see it on BET or UPN or WB, People would say, man, we don't even exist. So what we fought for years ago, are trying to get up in these places and get our faces on TV, in the movies, on records, was to actually have all of it being presented as a total reflection of culture. Instead, only a sliver of it has, yep, I got 10, yeah, you know, matter of fact, I'll just talk for five minutes. Only a sliver has been accepted as an aspect of coming up out of us. So all this plays into the rap and hip hop game. Cats be coming up to me, oh man, I wish the old days were coming back. You know, like, you put it down and BDP and Eric B and Rock Kim. I heard Primo doing Rock. Look, man, let me tell you, every generation gonna choose their own regardless. These days ain't coming back, no. Ain't coming back, never. New days can't come ahead. In this decade, the old deck is what I call it, the decade of the zero, and the new millennium, not millennium, millennium, some days might be ahead where people have their own thought capacities. This is beyond music. We all like our music, but music is still gonna be there regardless. What's gonna be inside the beats? Depends on what the people could put the chokehold around the situation that control the people. Um, give you this, just get this cases in thought. First of all, I'd like to leave everybody with my email address. Mr. Chuck, M-I-S-T-A-C-H-U-C-K at rapstation.com. I'm going to say that again. Don't ask me again. Just make a friend. <laughs> be interactive with human beings. Because you know how people are. We be, you know, Prince has said, be on top of technology instead of technology being on top of you. Control the computer instead of the computer controlling you, because everybody's going to deal with it next year. Cats be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, yo, I got my two-way, which is like uh, introduction. But we be playing games with the two-way, you know. So fresh and so clean on your two-way. Okay, now what? Mr. Chuck at rapstation.com. What led me into technology, I made a concentrated effort five years ago. I said, you know what? I did all I could do. I was on 43 tours. 43, I've been through three passports, 53 countries. If I didn't show up in Philly, I was in Africa, Asia. And yeah, hip hop's and all those Eastern Bloc, South America. People ask me a dumb, stupid question like, yo, Chuck, um, they like hip hop in Hong Kong? Yeah, but what do you think I went there for? 
paid to get me out there. So the world is beyond Philly, and the world is beyond the 2,000 by 3,000 mile box they call the United States. They keep Americans dumb. Americans barely know another language. Ebonics is not a language, it could be, but you gotta use it to your advantages. Just kicking it at the end of the club. Yeah, so I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? I hop, right? <laughs> meanwhile, you start saying, you know, like after the party, do you want to go to breakfast? I mean, true, true. So what got me involved, I said, you know what? Time out. Because what else? After 1994, I said, you know, I'm not what to, you know, they call it, I'm not a full-time artist. I stopped doing that in 1994. I didn't quit, because who the hell gonna give up music? I'm an artist. Would a painter ever stop painting? No. No. Ray Charles doing music at 67. I mean, I'll be doing music. I ain't gonna be jumping around at First Union. No. I, was, I considered myself something like a coach, you know, come in, step in once in a while, maybe pinch hit, maybe I'll do a song, maybe not, I do it for the love. Same thing that got me into it. I do all kinds of other economic things to make me have a living. I, there's 36 different occupations in the music business. We as black folks love music, but we only know a four. Yo, so Chuck, you producing there? <laughs> train producers. I produced in 1986. I mean, it's, I do nine different things. Write books, do lectures, you know, I, I create internet super sites and commodities around the planet. A lot of times it troubles me. Somebody might come up to me, I might be in the neck of the hood. Yo, so dog, where you coming out with something, man? What you doing and shit? I was on the first, I was on the front page of the paper. The same city here. Yo, Bob, you know what I'm saying? I don't be reading the paper. You said don't believe the hype and shit. <laughs> when I said don't believe the hype, it meant to challenge information. Being that we're in an information age, we're also in a misinformation age, which means we have to be able to navigate at all the things that are coming at us at faster speeds than ever before. That's why somebody next to you could get flipped out and twisted real quick and you might not get twisted because they might not be able to handle the information or might not pick up all the facts. But then they feel it's enough to go on and then kick it and reiterate it in the street like it's information when it's totally wrong or whack. So I got involved in that. I told Russell, I said, you know, he, Russell made his deal, you know, with Polygram. And I said, it's time for me to get up out. I had one more album in my contract, and I said, I'm not recording no more for y'all. I've been there, done that enough already. I did it all. Now, if anything, the thing that made me want to do rap music and hip hop is to make changes and make it, make it a difference. The biggest revolution ever in music is right now. Downloadable digital distribution. I would do these dumbass seminars around the country for eight to nine years and everybody get up and, well, what we, what we need is distribution. All of a sudden the distribution comes and nobody gonna tell, well, well how do you make money? <laughs> First of all, you coming up with the bottom, you coming up with the bottom line before you come up with the method. Get involved with the internet, but not just being on it, controlling property in it and being able to rule it as far as it pertains to your skill and craft. How you do it, that's up to you. I've been in the music business 20 some odd years. I know how it works top, lock, stock, and barrel for me. I testified in Congress three, what, three weeks ago, and also last year, to take the big corporations down. Why the hell you think they are begging the government to save them? Because for the first time, the technology has been in the public before the industry came out with it in the past, right? And you know, they want people to be sheeple. They, you know, they used to have this company up in New York that said, you know what? An educated consumer is our best customer. That's a goddamn lie. 
they could get you to buy the same thing 50 times over and over again. Oh, yeah, well, hey, they love you to death. You got people, $100 in their pocket, got to get the $179. I was like, oh, my baby got to have the best. Your baby got to have the best, but you only got $100. So you think the best is buying them something. It's all right to have nice things, but to worship them, what? So, I mean, things like industry controlling technology. Case in point, back in the 70s, well, yeah, you got a record, you ain't got a record player. So you got to have a record player. Industry made those decisions. You got a record player, what's the first thing you want to do? Get records. Some people thought 45s and never die. Remember me? Man, I ain't getting my, my record. You know, you all got that drunk uncle. Yeah, I see. I ain't never get with my mom gay. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Soon Uncle Pete's record player don't work no more. He mad as hell. How do you mean make no, no record players like I'm used to? Like the type that you play the song and come back like this. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't make it no more like that, Uncle Pete. All of a sudden, Uncle Pete, you know, and, you know, and the same thing got me even on cassettes. I never really, I said, man, I ain't never leaving cassettes. Today, you can't give nobody cassette. That decision didn't come from y'all. Technology made you think different. Try to give somebody a cassette. Yo, here's my cassette here, and listen to my demo. I ain't got no cassette player. <laughs> well, and when did that come along? Because you know, in the beginning of the 90s, you know, y'all had a cassette player, even though some of y'all 11, 8, 9 years old. But you definitely wasn't thinking about CD. These, these decisions was made in late 1970. And it's late 1970. They know what the people are going to buy because they control every move you do. Every move. They say, yeah, we got the people wagging to our tail. I said, yo, the first car I bought. I, didn't, I couldn't even afford no cassette player. I had the eight track with the cassette adapter that you had to stick up in there. I said, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm in there now. Then later on, I got the cassette player. Everything was good. Then all of a sudden, the CD came out. And how much is a damn CD? $17. I was already recording already. I had records on CD and wouldn't buy them. Yo, yo, Chuck, I bought this new Public Enemy CD. I wouldn't buy that shit. <laughs> Got a ride with a homegirl in California. This is 1990. She had the DOC album. All of a sudden, it's in her car, the CD player. I'm like, yeah, so you got a CD player, right? Yeah, yeah, what, what, what track you want to listen to? Five? Oh. Yeah, it worked like that. Yeah, you want to hear it again? <laughs> kind of turned me out. <laughs> Turn me out. Oh, Uncle Pete? Oh, let me tell you how Uncle Pete got turned out. I got the CD playing now. Uncle Pete, you know, he's real mad because he can't get none of them turntables no more. <laughs> And he can't buy no more records. All of a sudden, they don't be selling no records no more. Well, Uncle Pete, I got this thing called the CD. You can get rid of cassette player. What you mean? Yeah, it got what's going on. And matter of fact, it ain't just got what's going on on it. It got Trouble Man on it, too. What? How much this thing cost, Chucky? $17. What the hell? No. Uh -uh. I show Uncle Pete how it works. Mercy, mercy me. Ta, 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 ta. Whoa. Next time I saw Uncle Pete, hey, when you gonna bring me some more of them CDs? He got, he done bought his whole record collection all over again for twice the price. Oh, Uncle Pete got bit by the dog. He bought his record collection twice at twice the price. How much was they making a CD for? CD cost 60 cents to make. 950 wholesale. 1799 retail. 
Then they tell you, oh, well, we got to look out for the artist. Artists getting 10% of the wholesale. I'm like, why well, I'm getting 10% of the wholesale? Well, Chuck, says a lawyer, well, one out of every 10 artists fail. We have to market and promote, and then that one every 10 artists makes it, and nine out of every 10 artists fail, that constitutes 10% standard royalty rate for the artist. I'm like, yo, I'm selling millions of records. What the fuck that got to do with me? <laughs> it got to be 50-50. I got something you need, you got something I need. Well, I am. Making the CD for 60-something cent. The music business made this change in 1979 because in the late 1970s, the music business was run by creative people. But creative people have a fallacy too being a little bit too creative. They would have things like during the disco boom where they made boodles and boodles of money, they would come up with these incredible ideas like, well, we had this promotional party. Ethel Merman's disco record has just come out. You know how we'll promote it? We'll go down to Studio 54 and just get 100 yards of coke and have all the DJs snort it. It'll be a bash, baby. Spend $780,000 in Studio 54, and all of a sudden, keep doing that shit for Ethel Merman type records? The music business went down. Along the same time with the de-emphasizing of school, musical history and musical study classes, out of that ashes rose what? Hip-hop. Hip-hop in 1979 came out with records. The first one, unofficially was by King Tim III with the Fat Back Band, Personality Jack. It was sort of there, kind of, but yo, he was rapping, kind of cool. 1979, the whole Northeast was hip-hop bananas. Cats were scratching with pumas. No more different than that. It was bananas. Yo, it was cats with bananas. 80,000 people up in the Meadowlands with turn around, three stripes, we are family Pittsburgh pirate hats. Pumas, Lee jeans and suits. All of a sudden, Sugar Hill Gang comes out with Rappers of Life. No, not Eric Sermon and Red Man. Later on that winter, Lady B comes out with To The Beach Show. Independence start getting on top of this music phenomenon. The music business said we got to be able to take people out of records and we got to figure out how to make our money three times over. The lawyers and the accountants in the major record companies assume the position of the creative people who are bugged the fuck out. And you know what lawyers and accountants do? They come up and fix the aftermath. Not the Dre label, the aftermath. They came in, fixed it up, and assumed executive positions. When they assumed the executive positions in the beginning of the 1980s, their number one job was to change the configuration on how people bought music, and they knew it was going to be a 10-year program. 1983, through classical music, they introduced the compact disc. At that time, it took them maybe four hours to make one compact disc. Knowing that by 1987 and 1988, when everything was in position, they would make a 400 or 500% profit on it wholesale. By the end of the 1980s, the CD had become part of the average person talking about this next configuration. Record companies make money off of what? Copyrights that they own. Also called catalog. They can own something from 1940 and sell it to you in 2001 for $17.99. Because they own the copyright. And even get people to lobby in D.C. to change the public domain law. Beyond hip hop, ladies and gentlemen, Six companies at that time called the Big Six. Polygram, located where at that time? 
a Philips company located in the Netherlands. Also Holland, Dutch Shoes, Amsterdam, <laughs> EMI Thorn out of the UK, the U United Kingdom. We are standing for Warner Electra and Atlantic Records, consortium put together by Steve Ross, who owned a whole bunch of parking garages in New York City. Sony, before that, there was CBS. Sony came in as a what? Hardware company and bought the what? Software company. So it was easy since you had the software company and the hardware company to actually get the transition of the configuration across. You got a record company and now they also make these CD players. Walkman, CD Walkman. Many of y'all came up in the 90s as teenagers. You bought your CD Walkman later on, right? Why did you buy it? Because, hey, you know, I don't know what they ain't you, you know what I'm saying? I just like my music to myself. Don't you think somebody made a decision? It had nothing to do with Ghostface Killer. BMG, the notorious BMG. Located where? Bertelsmann Music Group, located Germany. And MCA, Music Corporation of America, the big six. Now they're the big five because Polygram merged with Universal. EMI is still there, possibly merging with Time Warner if they could get by the, the governments trying to keep them from creating monopoly. And then you have Sony and BMG who have talked about merging. So you have three major corporations controlling 90% of all the music. All right, yeah, Chuck, you're talking. I mean, where are you leading us to? I mean, what you saying, really? These decisions were all made in the 80s, going up into the 90s to where we are right now, and y'all ain't had nothing to do with it. Y'all just gonna follow and support the music industry because for the first time, a seven-year-old kid matters to the bottom line. You buy 17, a seven-year-old kid, a CD, they can lock themselves in a room and lock themselves away and still, Eleven ninety nine is being spent. E mommy, mommy, be buy me this. You never had that before. So the music business made much more money, and the executives that made it happen. Did the artists get their increase? No, they still under 10, 12, 14 percent. But the executives went from six to seven, and sometimes eight figure salaries. This is guy that worked for Motown for one year. He worked for one year and got fired, and what he saw in severance pay was more than I seen in my whole goddamn career. I said, fire my ass. <laughs> no, but my shit was owned. I realized all this in 94 and 95. They said, well, you know what? It's a complex argument because it could be irrelevant to the marketplace. Yes, it could be, but at the same time, what am I known for? <laughs> Raging against the damn machine anyway. Where does this matter? Uncle Pete went and brought his whole collection all over again. The industry said, we're gonna get into the next phase because the minute that they made the CD, what did they do to music? They digitized it. The minute you digitize anything, it's transferable as an electronic message. Just like you send an email, you can send a song under a different compression. That's what MP3 is about. A lot of people say, yeah, I heard of MP3, what does that mean? MP3 is a compression. Quite simply, and you remember this the rest of your time. When you hear a regular C CD, it's WAV file. WAV file is your, how you hear a CD on a CD player, call, whatever. Compression, you know, smashes the sound so it can fit. What does that mean? MP3 is 10 to 1 in compression. Meaning that if you got 70 minutes on your CD full of music, with MP3 compression, you could get 700 minutes of music. You can make the file small enough to damn near put it over the phone line. And especially if you got broadband or cable, you can send it real quick. But the majors 
didn't see that coming because they thought that they would control that configuration too. And when all this got figured out in the public, then they all screaming, punking at, asking government. Yeah, ask government for nothing. People say, what do you think? I say, I can't ask government for a damn thing. Well, I want to ask government for it. They asking government to save them. I'm going to government and say it's too late. Nothing they can do. I got my daughter bootleg in Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> no, on the real. I'm giving you a real conversation. <laughs> Nasty and all that, as a parent, I got three. 15, 13, and 8, I ain't buying a damn CD. <laughs> no, let me tell you. Yo, my son, he wanted to listen to some music. He, yo, he wanted Commons album. And he wanted this joint by Madonna. So I'm like, Madonna? <laughs> <laughs> he liked this one song that she did, but you know, he didn't know the name of it. Because today, with kids, they might not know, know, the, know the title, but they say, yeah, I like track six. Uh, track eight is all right. <laughs> track 11 is wrong. I said, all that time that the artist made the title, you were there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went up in the media play, the spot where you get the music or whatever. and. I said, maybe it's on this. So we pick it up, they even have a kiosk where you hear it. He gets to the car, he's like, <laughs> nah, they on here. Same time, go back in, go through another CD. I'm like up at the register. Can I at least hear what's on this? No, well, we can't open it. Finally he got the one and it luckily was on there. After that, I got all my kids on Napster. They got to go download anything you want. Because you know people get up there, well, they only listen to the radio, they don't want one song. Even something that's good, like Stankonia, Outcast, you know, you're like, oh, I don't like, you know, Simon's Jackson. And now she likes so fresh, so clean, because they hear it on the radio. They only want two songs. Why the hell are they going to buy $17 worth of songs that ain't no way? They only going to keep going with track three. Track three. Track three. But that's how radio programs you. You know, people look at video. Be like, oh, they real busy. No, you're looking at the same damn video. <laughs> you know, I do a video back in the day. People or some, they might show it a hundred times. People are like, oh man, you busy, you busy. I don't know. You watching the same damn video. It only took me one day to do the video. <laughs> I've been sitting on my tag. Now you sitting there being programmed like a robot. So these companies, to make a long story short, and a short story shorter, and D is that the configurations have changed and now it's in the public's hands. I encourage everybody to go, get your computer and get your music free. You ain't affecting the artists. The artists getting paid on advances. They ain't getting no royalties. When you see Missy Elliott come over and get, get your freak on 2.5 million dollar web video, you go, really? They spent two point five some million dollars on the whole promotion because the average three million dollars to promote a record. By the time y'all make a decision on it, by the time young brother right there decide to like a record, they already spent three million dollars. That's not an artist's decision. That's a corporation's decision. That's why in the case of Tupac and Biggie. Hey, look, they're going to sell Tupac and Biggie for a long time. Number one, a dead man can't renegotiate. <laughs> it's always easier to also sell and praise a dead black man than the living one anyway. Right. You would think that Malcolm X would be on the stamp. Oh, it's better to deal with 30 years later after he dies. <laughs> Dr. Khaled Muhammad, cats are like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Then he died, now all of a sudden he's easier to deal with. He didn't do a damn thing when he was little. Well, I didn't totally believe in everything he said. You ain't supposed to, supposed to believe in everything anybody said. You a damn fool if you up there. Oh, I agree, I agree, true, true, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Have your own mind. And then uh, us as black people, when you want to talk about leadership, we don't necessarily need leaders that always got to make everybody feel good. Right. Sometimes we need them motherfuckers that everybody hate except us. <laughs> oh, I can't stand it. You know, no, we have to feel good leadership. And everybody, you know, at the, at the same time, the feel good leadership making a deal with the devil. Right. At the same time, the masses of black people are just lost in the source. Right. Bob Johnson is controlling all black television makes a deal, and we left out holding the, in the cold with no control. So I mean, all this is beyond 
hip hop. These decisions are made well beyond you trying to fi figure out, oh yeah, I'm, I'm really feeling comment on this. I'm feeling dead prez. I'm really feeling this. I mean, it's beyond that. These are these are glimpses into having the aspect of possibly looking into yourself and making your own decision. <laughs> yes, hip hop belongs to young people, but you know that people like 35 and 40, they used to love hip hop. What's up with the drop off factor? You might feel that nothing is actually interpreting anything to you through music. It is. But really, you might have to go to a lot of young heads to get to it to understand what's going on now to change it. And that's where I'm feeling, you know, y'all yeah, love hip hop to the bone marrow. And y'all heard me say references up here that definitely I know what I'm talking about. I know what's current, what's underground, what's under the underground. I run hip hop commodities. I got rapstation.com. Rapstation.com got 10,000 artists on it. Startup entrepreneurs. Reason I'm talking right up here, just the fact that what I know I'm talking about is that big business plays in it of dominating because if somebody out here wants to start a record label or you want to get put on, you, you wishing for a, a, a prayer in hell to get put on a radio station locally and get put on a major record label. So you say, all right, I want to have my own thing. But your own thing can't exist in the whole traditional world that was here before you. The world of distribution and getting your music out and building your own politicking with promoters, spaces, cities, other heads and other places around the world. Let me tell you, other places around the world, cats and hip hop are advanced. They, not, they don't have that luxury of radio to get swept in and say, this is that. No, they already advanced. You know, you can go over, I can go over to Switzerland and do 15,000 people deep up in Geneva tomorrow if I was an artist full time. <coughs> cats and Billy are only gonna know what the radio station tell them. Or you're gonna wait for the monthly edition of the source to have a peep in on it. <laughs> Prime example, David Mays, young white kid in Harvard, starts a tip sheet in 1989. Nobody cares because hip hop's all from the heart. Yet still, with the sources in the barber shop, sitting on the table, cats are scrambling for it. Interpretation coming through some other sense of ownership. Oh yeah, but you know what I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta check up on what's going on. These are the opportunities that each and everybody, if you want to be interactive in the hip hop game, start your own label, I say start a website. Website won't cost you as much. Starting a label right now, oh number one, let me tell you your cost, and this is what really discouraged a lot of people from doing their thing in the 90s. You start a label, what does that mean? Oh, you went into the studio. You spent money in the studio. Today, getting a computer, you can record songs, in the studio at your own crib, if you know what you're doing, technically, okay. you can have your own studio for a thousand dollars and understanding the software. Not recording demos, recording digital records. Okay? Number two, traditionally, you would, let's say you went to the studio, you spent some cheese up in there, right? Then you came up out of there. And pressed up what? CDs. You went to disc makers and they gave you a deal for a thousand CDs, which is nothing as far as distributing them, and that cost you some more. So you got a thousand CDs sitting up in your mom's living room. <laughs> now you say, well, damn, how can I get some of this play? I'm going to go to disc makers. Y'all make wax? Y'all make wax? And so you got 300 pieces of vinyl sitting in your mom's living room. <laughs> And now, okay, now what do we do now? So we got to get guides, magazines, and stuff like that. So you got CDs, you get vinyls, you got a mail list. So you got to go to the post office and find 500 people to send these CDs and vinyls to. It's going to cost you more money to send. Then hopefully you find somebody in the local radio station in the club who already getting 70 pieces of vinyl a week from where? Five major record companies who can put, they can spend 
$500,000 on a video and not blink. Here, you done came up, okay, you're a baller, right? How, you know, how long is your ball? <laughs> you got $25,000, you're a big baller. How far do you want to go? Okay, you got all this press, you recorded it all. I know that it's hot and everything. Can you make a video? BT ain't taking that video unless you spend the 200000 on it. That knocked, that knocked that ball right out of the ball. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to have a video. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm, on this, this pan span right here, I'm giving you all the practicality on how you can get the music game or just watch it unfold. Because we've been watching it unfold over the last 20 years. Cats love music, they dig hip hop, don't know what the fuck is going on. Cats have been in the music game. Oh, you know, I mean, he, he, Jermaine Dupri, yeah, he, he making music. I mean, there's a million cats that make beats. He's just in a situation where he's a high paid employee. All he do is do something and get his check. That's cool, too. That ain't saying nothing to somebody who's trying to make it as a, a squad in Philly. You want to start now if you can't get a deal tomorrow, or you can't build a company now, you're going to figure out how to get in a trillion dollar business of music. That trillion dollar business of music, five companies want it all. And they're going to make it hard for an independent entrepreneur. And since the music comes about the people, don't you think the people have a shot to have their own businesses? So, you send it out to all the DJs, you send it by the average DJ across, even the college DJ. Got a stack of vinyl 50 deep every week. And you send them this piece of vinyl from Philly, and they in Wichita, Kansas. And of course, the, the label head is going to come by and say, You playing the 10 joints we send you? We'll send you to Hawaii. Before you used to be wild women in song, oh, now you'll be like, We'll send you to a convention with weed, chicks, and you know, play our song. <laughs> so, Startup entrepreneur wants to get into the game, the internet. It has its own radio system. I had a, uh, I have a situation called BreakingNoise.com, voted by Yahoo as the top internet radio site, period. Not hip hop radio site. This top internet radio site, period. I started PublicEnemy.com. The reason I did He Got Game is just to start PublicEnemy.com. Not because I was like trying to like, you know, trying to like go on a tour and find past the Lord. That don't mean nothing to me. I do a record, I build a site. I use somebody else's marketing and promotion, I build a site for the future of distribution. That's why I've been in those ranks. Brainthenoise.com, somebody sent me vinyl. We got seven shows across the week, across the world. I set up eight tours across the world. Seven figure tours. At rapstation.com, we have 10,000 artists. People have their own label. They submit, they upload their, their label, uh, their, their music, with a link to their label. Don't cost them nothing. Still, they get a chance to make their music and expose their thing to the world and build from there. Of course, they can't expect limos and Four Seasons and stuff like that. And bling it, no. But so are you doing it from the love? Yeah, you start from one. People up there talk about, oh, I got a fan base of 576,492. No. Record companies, sales departments sell records. Artists don't sell records. Artists could die. Record companies still going to sell it. I got, look. I, Polygram owns the copyrights and the masters. I mean, Universal. I still got public enemy records selling to this day. They own it. Yes, I get my piece, but they own it. And yesterday I'm in Knoxville, I'm signing nine albums. Yeah, they own it. They're going to make sure they're going to sell it. And I'm going to be on their ass too, accounting. They know that. <laughs> but I want to be able to see people just not be fans of business, but also to get into the business without spending your money. Get in, you love it, participate, get involved with it. Once you start to do or try to emulate what the big guys do, you're going to be broke. Spend your money practically. So that's my message to cats that want to get involved in doing their thing. There's radio. You want to make a video? The $500 video has come back on the internet. We have a section called Rap Station TV. You should have been on a camcorder. You show it. I mean, you can upload it. 
with MP4 technology and it could be seen. This is a month away. You shoot a video for $30,000, you shoot a video for $65,000, you think BET going to play it? No. You can't afford to lose $65,000, I don't care how much you pull. You could be cartel down. <laughs> Corporation could spend $2 million to say right off. So they could spend 10, they could spend $20 million to keep the startup entrepreneur out. And that's the story of the music game right now. That's why you hear one train of music. When it comes down to your comments, the roots, dead prayers, Jill Scott, you gotta fight for those artists. A 13 year old ain't gonna fight for them. They might have the time to call a radio station all damn day. You know as a grown person, you ain't got time to call a damn radio station. <laughs> right? Put well, my name to Mika in, you know what I'm saying? I wanna hear it. <laughs> you turn on the radio, you ain't calling no damn station. So that's one thing that the ownership of radio stations got to know. They got to be, they have to know that the quality of the people that they broadcast to is sometimes more important than the quantity. I'm gonna talk myself out. <laughs> but there, but listen to this. Quite simply, right? Life, have a good time for a long time. You gotta know how to treat. Life, you ever notice how older people just say, it seems like time is moving faster? That's true because it's mathematical. When you eight, a year is an eighth of your life. When you're 40, a year is a 40th of your life. So it seems smaller, it's a mathematical equation. We must know some math. <laughs> Sometimes we got to look at calendar and make sure that there's lines on our calendar, not just a blank screen <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Especially if you're here in America, I mean, you can go to spots like Africa where it's hot all the time or down on the island, they say, no problem. No problem, it's hot, you know, we get to that. Now, the next one was hot, they got siesta, we get to that. In America, you got to move and hustle. <laughs> got the move, especially when they get cold. How you gonna get on some heat? <laughs> <laughs> so my whole thing is, yo, I don't you know, people see me on TV, so they all shut to you, is this right? Of course I'm gonna be on TV and sound intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> if they give me six seconds, if I'm there with flavor, you know we're gonna take four. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta make sense for two seconds. <laughs> So I've never given out an aspect of my personality because television, you got to capitalize on saying something that people can build on. That's right. <laughs> you know, me and Flavor had a thing, you have a thing going even in this day. Flavor, I'm saying, I don't care, we can Martin Lawrence, they can get anybody. Flavor walk in the room, he out clowning them all. <laughs> Everybody. You know, you make guys like Chris Tucker straight up. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I tell people, have fun with your life. But as an adult, you gotta have a different type of fun than a teenager. Teenagers can have fun, but you know, as an adult, you know you got accountability and responsibility. Y'all know what it is. Y'all grown, you don't need nobody to tell you that. Y'all know what makes you scowl when you get that bill coming in for what you did. Look, I don't know. <laughs> you don't, don't deal with it, your phone cut off. You might have been, you know, posturing and front and blinging on the block and all, but you know, you ain't pay your selling bill. It ain't like back in the day where all the illegal selling. Some people got illegal and most people got to pay. So my, my advice, leave here with your own mind. Try not to disagree for the sake of it. Don't be a robot. People, places, and things are the fruit of life. I've never drank before, but you gotta treat it like wine. You don't guzzle wine, you sip it. You sip life. Be less impulsive, deal as it comes to you. People are to be cherished just as much as places and things. We seem to place our importance on what? Things. People don't mean a damn thing. You take a benzo right here, a person over here dying of AIDS, take a metal wrecking ball and smash that benzo, people are like, ooh, you see what they did to that benzo? Person could be dying right here. I'm in New York, I see people stepping right over people. 
They just seen some like Lexus crash. They're like, oh my God, that Lexus is fucked up. <laughs> Falling in love with machines, Matrix, and also places. One thing I think about today's hip hop nation is that at least young people like to travel. 12 years ago, we thought coming to Philly was a big, I mean, when I was growing up, coming to Philly was a big deal, 100 miles. Now young people want to get down to, to Cancun, go to Atlanta. You know, traveling opens your mind. Try to leave the 2,000 by 3,000 mile box. You can get down to Rio in Brazil, and you can get down there rather inexpensively, down to Bahia up over to Africa, South Africa, waiting for mines to go over there and make some money. They ain't gonna come quick. You can't buy respect. You gotta be more build, build. So travel will open up your mind. And you always can come home to Philly. Philly gonna be here regardless. <laughs> Philly gonna be here. Coming back and running Philly might be a different story. You gotta work for that. You got Rage Against the Machine. We got Mamiya and Bujamar behind bars right now, and most black people in this city don't know his name. Crackers just say, you know what? Black folks will forget. Just like in Cincinnati, black folks will get mad. All of a sudden, all we got to do is have a Super Bowl. They'll stop being in the street. They'll bet on the game, and then all of a sudden, bet on teams and get that whatever they was mad at. So, my last statement is like, you gotta just understand where we at. You're smart, especially if you're in college. If you understand, you understand things around you, you ain't gotta drown yourself in thinking stress to fix the situation. All you gotta do is just be as intelligent as possible, and that will emulate. People wanna follow intelligent people who actually keep their head up, who are fearless, People also want to have a respect for people that pretty much have their own state of mind. They'll gravitate to that. When it comes down to children, however, I do think that those that do know can actually force the broadcasting stations that communicate to the people to make those changes by any means necessary. I thank you. Sorry, I got long way.